On Wednesday, members of the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing met to discuss government funding of community development block grants. Over the next several hours, you will see testimony by a number of witnesses, including representatives of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, along with state, county, and municipal officials from Florida, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Washington State. We take you now to Capitol Hill for Wednesday's proceedings, which were gaveled to order by subcommittee chairman and six-term Democratic Congressman Tom Lantos of California. Subcommittee will please come to order. This is the second hearing by the Employment and Housing Subcommittee on misuse of HUD Community Development Block Grant Funds, CDBG funds. This program, funded at more than $3 billion annually, is the largest single source of federal government assistance to state and local governments for economic and community development purposes. At a time when Congress is considering legislation to jumpstart the economy by increasing funding for this program by some $10 billion, it is particularly important that we address the problem of waste and abuse in this program. With more Americans out of work, a growing homeless population, and increasing poverty, this program is a critical tool in helping many communities across America with neighborhood revitalization, economic development, and improved community facilities and services. Under this program, federal funds are provided on a formula basis to state and local governments through flexible block grants to provide decent housing and a suitable living environment and to expand economic opportunities chiefly for low and moderate income persons. These projects must meet at least one of three national objectives benefit low and moderate income persons, aid in the prevention or elimination of slums and blight, or meet urgent community development needs. The program has accomplished tremendous good since it was created in 1974. However, in some communities, the program has been mismanaged, funds have been misused, Regulations have been disregarded, and there has been little effort to assure that jobs are being created for low and moderate income people. Federal tax dollars are being wasted. At our hearing last fall on this program, we heard testimony about the Capital District Islanders professional hockey team in Troy, New York, which can justly be called America's team since the franchise was purchased using federal funds. We also examined the $400,000 grant by HUD to the Cabazon Indian tribe in Southern California to build an off-track betting parlor on the reservation adjacent to their existing gambling casino. Last year, this wealthy tribe of less than 30 individuals 
grossed more than $20 million from gaming operations and had a net income of just under $2 million from its various other businesses. We also focused on a million dollar loan by the District of Columbia to a funeral home owner to construct a new larger facility to expand his business and to create new jobs. Although these funds were provided four years ago and they have been spent, there is nothing to show for the one million dollars but a vacant lot. The projects that we will be examining today illustrate similar problems in the administration of the Community Development Block Grant Program. There is the reverse Robin Hood problem. That is to say, taking HUD funds intended to benefit the poor and giving it to the rich. The City of Miami used these funds to provide a $5.4 million loan at 1% interest to an investment group headed by a multimillionaire Saudi Arabian sheik, Amin Jamil Al Dalawi, to restore a downtown office building. Taxpayers were told not to worry because the loan was secured by a letter of credit, yes, you guessed it, from the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI. Fortunately for taxpayers, when the developer was unable to repay the loan, BCCI did repay this loan. While the renovation of this historic building, Freedom Tower, is complete, we are left with yet another vacant office building in downtown Miami. In another case, the city of Miami used these funds to make a loan of $200,000 to help a theater, the Coconut Grove Playhouse, pay its debts. The theater is located in a glitzy commercial area that attracts the affluent, many of whom shop and dine in nearby establishments. It does not appear, however, that any jobs were created for low and moderate income persons. The city of Miami attempted to justify this loan based on the trickle-down theory of economics. I'm a very strong supporter of the arts and favor government efforts to help nonprofit theaters, but not with HUD money. HUD funds should not be used to assure that the theater curtain rises on a performance of Les Miserables. Rather, HUD money should be used to create housing, jobs, and economic opportunities for low income people who are not acting but living Les Miserables every single day of the year. HUD funds should be used to provide decent housing for people, not to support playhouses. After a two-year battle with HUD, the city of Miami finally conceded and paid back the monies to HUD using non-HUD monies. The Delaware County, Pennsylvania, in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, the county's Partnership for Economic Development misspent almost $6 million in CDBG funds. The county's Economic Development Loan Program was mismanaged so badly that the HUD Inspector General recommended terminating it. In examining the CDBG program abuses in Delaware County, our focus will not be on who acted improperly. We know about the abuses that occurred. HUD funds being used for lavish banquets and bar tabs, Broadway show tickets, ineligible loans, no-bid contracts, $60,000 for an eight-minute videotape and $68,000 for brochures to promote the county, some $4,000 for plastic model airplanes and ceremonial shovels that were used as gifts, $495 for a Sioux Indian figure from the Franklin Mint that was also used as a gift, 
and seventeen hundred dollars for mugs with a golden trim. It appears they were giving away more free gifts than Ed McMahon. Our focus will be on how these abuses went undetected for so long. Who was monitoring the expenditures of HUD funds? At today's hearing, we will also be examining a series of loans totaling over a million dollars made by the City of Seattle to businesses without proper scrutiny that failed to create jobs for low and moderate income persons. In one instance, a cleaning company received HUD, a HUD loan to repair its roof. When the owner of the business was later asked whether any jobs for low and moderate income persons were created as a result of the loan, he responded that he believed the job requirement has, had been met because it provided a job for the roofer. Many HUD fund recipients are unaware of the need to create and to retain full-time jobs for low and moderate income people. And others simply disregard this requirement without sanction. This problem of jobs, in fact, not being created for low and moderate income persons is not unique to Seattle. According to a recently completed audit by the HUD Inspector General's Office, which reviewed 84 special economic development loans and grants to private businesses, totaling over $13 million, <coughs> made by 19 grantees, 50% of the almost 3,500 jobs estimated to be created or retained were not provided. <clears throat> In addition, more than half of the grantees didn't have adequate documentation that the jobs were taken by or made available to low and moderate income persons. The HUD Inspector General report, which we will hear later this, at this hearing, uh, they talk about serious problems in the administration of this program. The Inspector General calls upon HUD to improve, one, its regulations and guidance to program participants, two, its monitoring of grantees and program expenditures, and three, its enforcement of sanctions. We are holding this series of hearings not to bury this program, nor to praise it, but rather to improve it constructively. This program is not a substitute for general revenue sharing. In some communities it is being abused, and the system in place of self-policing is neither detecting nor deterring the misuse of these funds. Before I uh, call up the first panel, I would like to express my deep appreciation uh, to Wendy Adler of uh, the subcommittee staff, um, majority staff, for doing uh, the bulk of the outstanding staff work which was necessary for this hearing. I want to express my appreciation to the very able minority staff representative, Christina to Lelian for her good job and for our Chief of Staff, uh, Stu Weisberg, for his usual uh, indispensable help. The first panel of witnesses uh, will be comprised of Mr. Frank Castaneda, Director, Department of Community Development, Miami, Florida, Mr. Nassim Rahman, Vice President of Miami Freedom Tower, and representative of Saudi Arabian Sheikh Amin Jamil al-Dalawi, Ethelie Range, Miami community activist and former city commissioner, Marian Arti, chairwoman, Delaware County Council, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Would you please come up to the witness table? <coughs> Will you please stand and raise your right hands? You solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to offer is the truth, 
the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. I do. Please be seated. <coughs> We are most uh, appreciative of your appearing, ladies and gentlemen. Your prepared statements in their entirety will be entered in the record without objection. We have a lot of panels and a lot of witnesses, and I will be most grateful if you would be so kind and summarize your testimony so we may get to the questions. We will begin with you with uh, uh, Mr. Frank Castaneda. Thank you. And could you please speak very closely into the mic? Thank you. As the Director of the Department of Community Development for the City of Miami, I welcome the opportunity to make a presentation before this subcommittee and offer our views on these two particular projects and economic development in general. I would like to clarify before I, I go on, on on my prepared statement two statements that you made in your presentation, and one was on the issue of BCCI. I want to clarify that the loan for was called on July 26, 1991, which was way before any federal action was taken on BCCI, and uh, we acted uh, a lot faster and a lot sooner than the federal government did on that issue. The other issue is... Well, I, want to, I want to compliment you on that, because okay. that means that had you been a bit slower, the American taxpayer would be out even more money now, isn't that true? You, well, you, you, you got the loan uh, before their assets were frozen. That, that is correct, and the loan was fully repaid. Good. The other issue was that Saminko was never on default on this loan, and you implied that the Saminko loan was on default and it was not. <laughs> but let me, let me keep going on, on the presentation. Uh, national objective, removal of some and blight. Uh, for 15 years this building was in, in, in a deteriorating structure, it was a place where... where, uh, where Could I go back to the last point I made? Yes. Let's get into the particulars of that calling of the loan. Okay. You called that loan. That is that correct, true? sir. And when you called that loan, they couldn't repay it. Is that correct? The agreement was to, 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 to get the money from the bank. Uh, the, that's why we had a letter of credit. But that, that did not imply that Saminko was unable to pay the loan. Obviously, the bank BCCI has sufficient collateral from Saminko in order to, to, to hold the letter of credit. Well, on whom did you make the demand to pay the loan? BCCI. And that Direc was directly? That's correct. Directly. And Saminko was informed of our intent to call and that we were proceeding to call from BCCI. Okay. Please proceed. For 15 years, the Freedom Tower was an abandoned deteriorating structure in a tax increment district north of downtown Miami. Um, the purpose of the, of the loan was to renovate the Freedom Tower as a $5.4 million loan at a term of 1% for a two-year period. Private sector investment was $18.6 million. Total cost of investment was $26 million. The private investment could, cost... Could you repeat those figures? $5.4 million at a term of 1% for a two-year period. Private sector investment was $18.6 million. $18.6 million. That is correct. Total cost of investment was $26 million. Mm -hmm. Private invested investment constituted 80% of the total project cost. This building that we're talking about is a highly significant building north of downtown Miami in a tax increment district. It is located just across the street from Bayside, where the federal government pro provided a $6 million urban development action grant for the development of this amphitheater. This amphitheater was a prerequisite for Rouse to do a multi-million dollar investment in downtown Miami and bring a Rouse project to this area. HUD, through the urban development action grant program, provided a $6 million UDAC for the development uh, of this amphitheater with the intention of attracting people downtown and this spillover effect would go into Bayside. Uh, in addition, the city of Miami received two urban development action grants for developing... You mean the city of Miami? The city of Miami mm -hmm. the, uh, received two urban development action grants for, the, for giving funds to a developer to develop uh, Project 6 and 7, which are two high-rise projects consisting of 771 units. 
in that area. This whole area is a tax increment district, and as you can see, low-rise warehouse district in which we basically are trying to redevelop this area uh, north of Miami. I again, we also were able to build the Miami Arena, which is where the Miami Heat plays their basketball games and so forth. This whole area is a tax increment district. And since this building is at the front edge of the Biscayne Boulevard corridor, the city of Miami was very much committed into the rehabbing of this particular structure in order to push development westward. In addition, uh, the Freedom Tower has tremendous significance to Miami. Not only was it the, uh, the, 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 the birthplace of uh, the Miami News, but it was also the center for um, the arrival of, to the United States of uh, Cuban refugees. And because of that reason, it has a tremendous emotional uh, sense to Miami and so forth. The city had been trying to have this building rehabbed by developers prior to Samenko arrival in, in, in the Miami scene. And we have been discussing floats with, with developers which had not the financial capacity that Samenko had. And for that reason, they never went anywhere. It was at the time that Samenko became interested in the picture that the possibility of rehabbing the building at really no cost to the taxpayers of Miami, that became uh, feasible. Well, let me just, just comment on that last observation of no cost to the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. Urban, these funds are not unlimited, is that correct? To the, to the city of Miami, the city of Miami basically has... I'm talking about the federal government. The, we don't have an unlimited supply of these funds. Of which funds? CDBG funds. That is correct. So they are limited. That is correct. And if the funds are used in one project, they cannot be used in another project. Is Th that correct? That is correct. The issue I would like to ask you to focus on, because my questions will relate to this issue, is not the desirability of rehabilitating this tower, mm -hmm. which I am perfectly happy to stipulate, although unfortunately this tower is now just another empty office building in Miami. Is that correct? That is correct, but let me... Let me well, let me, let me pursue my line of okay. argument. The, there are two issues here. And I would be most grateful if you would try to focus your okay. observations on these two issues. Number one, does an enormously wealthy Saudi prince need a 1% loan which is designed to provide low-cost housing and blight removal and so on? Or can it be reasonably expected that for whatever reasons, commercial, charitable, community orientation, what not, that an enormously wealthy Saudi prince can do the job without getting such a heavily subsidized HUD allocation. That's item one. Mm -hmm. The second item that I am anxious for you to focus on is had you chosen not to put this money into the Saudi project, could you not have used it for some other useful project in the city of Miami. Having visited Miami on numbers of occasions, uh, I would have no difficulty, and I'm sure you would have no difficulty, of finding any number of worthwhile areas in providing assistance in low-cost housing, removing blighted areas, uh, providing jobs for low-income people, homeless people, and others. That's really the issue not whether the tower should be rehabilitated or not. Uh. The tower is a useful building. It has historic value. It should be rehabilitated. The question is, are scarce hot funds to be used for that purpose? Okay, let, let's deal with the, the two issues. As, as to the, whether Saudi Arabian prince or a wealthy individual requires funds from HUD, the federal government or, or the city for that matter, Obviously, they do not require, and they can take their money and go wherever they want to because they have the capacity to do that. However, if you are interested in attracting that individual and providing an incentive to take their, his money where the money actually does not flow, because, you know, in, 
we've been having a lot of problem attracting any type of development in this particular area. Money just does not flow into poor areas. Whether you're wealthy or poor, it does not flow. You have to create an incentive to attract that money. And basically, that's what we did with the, with the Sheik. And that's what, you know, the whole purpose was to create an incentive for him to go and to develop into a poor area. As to well, question number let two. Me, let me tell you why your explanation doesn't hold any water. Um, and I'm sorry that it doesn't. Uh, we will hear in a few moments uh, uh, testimony which, which I would like to read to you in part from the developer. Please listen to me closely. Mm -hmm. We completed the purchase of the Freedom Tower in late 1987 and immediately announced our plans to renovate and restore this historic building. Soon thereafter, City of Miami officials suggested we apply for a CDBG loan to finance part of the restoration costs. So with all due respect, and you may care to restate your testimony, because you are under oath, mm -hmm. the causality runs exactly the other way. I shall repeat the prepared written testimony of the owners, and they will read it themselves. Please listen closely. We completed the purchase of the Freedom Tower in late 1987, <clears throat> and immediately announced our plans to renovate and restore this historic building. Now that to the naked eye, in plain English means, the Saudi prince bought the tower and immediately announced our plans to renovate and restore this historic building. Period. Soon thereafter, City of Miami officials suggested we apply for a CDBG loan to finance part of the restoration cost. Now let me analyze this mm. statement a bit because I want you to have a chance to go back and correct your erroneous mm. statement. The purchase was made totally apart from any HUD money. They bought this tower for reasons of their own, for good reasons of their own. <coughs> they buy the tower and they immediately announce to restore and renovate. 100% private money, not 80% private money. You still have the $5.4 million that's for you to give to urban development, low-cost housing, the homeless, all of this. You go to them. City of Miami officials go to them and say, hey, we got a 1%, $5.4 million loan for you, which you can use for this project. Now, would you like to rephrase your earlier testimony? No, uh, Congressman, what I would like... Would well, be then one of you, I one of you is not telling the truth. I would like Nassim Rahman to no, say no, 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 was. both can't be true. You can't argue on the one hand that the only reason this thing went ahead because you provided a $5.4 million loan, public money at 1%, and he cannot state that they bought it, they said they're going to restore it, and then the city of Miami comes to them with this very sweet deal. Both can't be true simultaneously. Now, you are still insisting that your version is true. Yes. Please go ahead. On, on the second issue as to the CD float, CD floats have to be guaranteed by letters of credit. A CD float basically functions as the amount of money that you have in your letter of credit that is committed to some other particular projects. Cities across the country have usually about one and a half years uh, funding in their letters of credit. That, that would mean that for the city of Miami, it, that would should run around $20 million what is available in their letters of credit. Since that fund is committed for, for actual projects, 
it is um, it is committed to other projects. So therefore, if you're going to use it as an interim use, you basically need to have um, uh, a guarantee uh, or something in order to guarantee that you're going to have that money when you need it for the other particular project. Because of that very particular reason, it is very difficult to properly utilize that fund. And, uh, uh, you know, through the years, uh, uh, we've done uh, 11 people have applied for CD floats. Uh, we, we've actually done two. Uh, one for uh, Samenko and the other one for YMCA. Um, it is not an easy fund to use and it's also opens the developer to a lot of criticism because in order to participate in the CD float, if you have to be wealthy uh, as you're stating in this particular case, um, you know, it opens yourself to a, to a lot of criticism and people do not want to go through, through all the problems of, of the float. Please proceed. No, uh, you're finished. Yes. Well, let me um, let me now ask Mr. Nassim Rahman, Vice President of Miami Freedom Tower and representative of uh, Saudi Sheikh Amin Jamil Al Dalabi to to uh, take the mic and make whatever presentation you wish. Be sir. grateful if you speak right into the microphone, sir. Sir, you already know the history and the background of Freedom Tower. You already know the history and the background of Freedom Tower and the circumstances in the, under which we renovated this building. Uh, I would like to make one correction that uh, you refer to Mr. Amin al Dalawi as a prince. He is not a prince. He's just a businessman and he's just a one, uh, it's a family business. With regard to um, restoration of Freedom Tower, in 1987, as you have correctly stated, we purchased it and we announced that we will renovate it. C could and you come a little closer to the mic, please? Yes, sir. We announced that we will purchase and renovate this property. And as you read, that we the city approached us for uh, funds that were available for restoration if we should ask for it. We did ask for it. Well, could I stop you there because we are at a critical point. In your prepared uh, statement, uh, uh, Mr. Rahman, on page three, yes. second paragraph, yes, I the have following to. statement appears I will read it to you as I read it to the earlier witness. And I'm asking you to either confirm it or to modify it. I'll read the statement. We completed the purchase of the Freedom Tower in late 1987 and immediately announced our plans to renovate and restore this historic building. Is this statement so far correct? Correct, sir. So you bought the tower without being assured of getting HUD funds, is that correct? That's correct. And you made the announcement, sir, to renovate and restore it prior to receiving any HUD funds correct. or applying for any HUD funds. Correct. I continue reading your prepared statement. Soon thereafter, City of Miami officials suggested we apply for a CDBG loan to finance part of the restoration costs. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, uh, let me go back to the previous witness. I've now read three times the prepared testimony. Um, Mr. Rahman confirms the accuracy of his prepared testimony. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand what he's saying. He's saying something which I'm convinced is absolutely correct. They purchased the tower and they announced that they're going to renovate it and restore it. And after they did that, the city went to them offering CDBG monies. Is that correct? Isn't that what he testified to? C could you ask Mr. Rahman why he ac asked and accepted the, the CD float? No, that's not my question. I am asking the questions. Mm. So let me, let me ask you 
to clarify the conflict between his testimony under oath and your testimony under oath. You will have to do that, because otherwise we will be getting into very serious difficulties. His statement is that the purchase of the building and the immediate announcement that they will proceed with renovation and restoration had nothing to do with CDBG monies. For all I know, they didn't know such monies existed. After they bought this building, after they announced that they will renovate it and restore it, all of it with private money, there was no other money, you folks went to them and offered them this 1% HUD money. That is what he's saying. Your initial testimony under oath was that there was no way of getting this restoration underway unless this incentive of 1% HUD money was offered. Now the two statements are in conflict. I'm giving you an opportunity to correct your original statement if you wish. If not, it will remain on the record. Okay. I, I either went to Samenko or to Nassim Roman to ask that they participate or go on a CD float. Number no, no, please answer the question I'm asking. Well, let me I'm asking a very simple question. Is it true, as Mr. Rahman testifies, that they made the purchase and they immediately announced their plans to renovate and restore prior to being told there being any HUD funds or asking for any HUD funds or presumably even knowing that such funds are available. They went ahead with a private transaction. I salute them. It will be helpful to the community. It is helpful to the neighborhood. It's a fine decision. They made it for their own business reasons, but it helps the community. And I tip my hat to them. Now, your statement directly contradicts his statement. I am asking you for the final time. Do you insist on maintaining your original statement that you had to provide this very attractive financial incentive of 1% loan to get this thing underway, or do you now wish to retract that statement and agree that they would have done it entirely with private funds? To the best of my knowledge, my statement is correct. Please proceed, Mr. Rahman. Sir, with regard to this loan, uh, I should point out that one of the problems has been in disbursing this loan was that they required a letter of credit which could be called within 48 hours for the entire amount of money. And so far as I understand it, subject to correction, they had a problem in finding a developer who would put up the entire money as collateral as a, uh, for the loan, which we came along, and I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, after 11 years, somebody came along and put that letter of credit up, guaranteeing the entire loan to be repaid within 48 hours. This <coughs> was a, I understand, was a hurdle in the city's path in awarding this loan to someone else. However, what we didn't know at that time, that by accepting this loan, we were required to comply with Davis-Bacon rules, guidelines, we were required to comply with affirmative actions, and that this requirement persisted even after the loan was repaid. It put a certain amount of burden on upon us as a developer because we had to submit uh, accounting process to the Community Development Authority for the amount of the wages that were paid and uh, we had to have extra administrative staff, which was us a burden. And then also that even after repayment of the loan to complete the rest of the work, we still had to comply with this rule. Now these we accepted, and we did. And in point of fact, 
I would say that city of Miami benefited greatly by us using this money because A, it brought life to that area. Freedom Tower brought life in that uh, rather depressed area of the t bordering on over, uh, Overtown Park West area, which was depressed and was a little unsafe. Now it has become relatively safe. <coughs> Movement has come. The land has been cleared. Lights have been put. Security is there. The city is moving in that direction. And we were the first. As far as economic benefit to us, it has been very little. And as you rightly said, the building is still vacant. Even though it is vacant, we are still holding it because in future it will do some good to the city and to us. But in the meantime, we are carrying it. I feel that uh, perhaps, so you people are penalizing a rich businessman uh, for taking this loan when it was available for, with all the terms and conditions that were imposed on us to comply with. I feel that's a little unfair because we have not done anything wrong. What we have done, we've complied with every direction terms, conditions, regulations, restrictions that's been imposed on us. And we used it for the purpose for which we were told to use it. And we've done the very best that we could. And I don't think that very many people can criticize us for the work that we have done. And I would like to be on record that it's not our mistake and it's not our fault for, any, uh, for taking this loan. questions to ask of you, but first we will hear from uh, Ms. Uh, Atheli Range, who is a Miami community activist and a former city commissioner. We are pleased to have you, and you may proceed any way you choose, Ms. Range. Thank you very much for the privilege of appearing before you this morning. In this 17th year of the history of the Community Development Block Grant Program, whose purpose I understand was developed to accomplish neighborhood development and preservation. The people of the targeted areas, that is, low and moderate income areas. During the early years of the Community Development Block Grant, most communities, like the City of Miami receiving funds, were primarily in the business of providing infrastructure improvements and housing rehabilitation. In the neighborhoods of Overtown and Liberty City in Miami, which later received national notoriety based on riots which have occurred over the past 13 years, millions of community development block grant dollars have been spent to rehabilitate housing development and improve general living conditions. However, these general updated conditions should have been a part, we believe, of one's everyday existence. Sewers, streets, sidewalks, lights, and recreational areas according to the neighborhood's needs through the dollars as in, through tax dollars as in all other areas. In 1983, the Community Development Block Grant Program regulations were altered to allow direct assistance to for-profit businesses. I have no objection to this provision as long as the program is not changing its original intent of addressing the needs of low and moderate income communities. In Miami's um, African American community, there are numerous businesses which need the support of programs which may s assist them with technical assistance, loans and loan guarantees to provide better services to low-income neighborhoods in which they operate. As an African-American business owner, I know the trials and tribulations of doing business in low-income neighborhoods. There's a great deal of assistance needed by those who really need it. 
and I am totally opposed to the Community Development Block Grant Program being taken advantage of by those businesses which have the resources and means to find private financing to initiate or expand business opportunities. May I stop you right yes. at that sentence? Uh, Ms. Range put her finger on the key issue that I have been attempting to explore uh, with the two of you gentlemen. These are limited funds. They are appropriated by the Congress for a very specific purpose. I fail to see any justification for providing these funds to financially very strong private businesses which on the strength of their own testimony were fully prepared to proceed with the project without any HUD low interest assistance. I fully agree with you, uh, 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 Mr. Rahman. You deserve no criticism. You, you completed a very interesting project. You were ready to do that with your private funds. Uh, may I ask you, did you know there were such funds available? Did you know about these funds uh, before they were brought to your attention? I believe we didn't know about this uh, fund. So you didn't even know about them. Now, Mr. Castaneda, I am really trying to help you. Mm -hmm. uh, they, need, they didn't need this incentive because they didn't even know this incentive existed. They didn't know that there were such hard loans mm -hmm. that they could get. They made a decision, they put down their money, and they announced they're going to restore the tower. And I salute them. Your testimony is you, that nothing would have happened had you not enticed them with a 1% loan to do that. Yeah. And the record flies in the face of that statement. Now, would you like now to modify your earlier statement, or you're still sticking con to con it? Congressman Landos, let me, let me tell you what I know of the situation. Be, be, let, let, me, let, let me answer your question. Uh, before Samingo became involved in the deal, there was a developer named Jerry Sanchez who was into historic renovations. And the city was assisting this developer to rehab this particular building. He did not have the financial ca capacity to, to get the letter of credit and so forth. I understand. And uh, we were discussing a 1% loan for this particular building. I understand. Okay. Saminko, Inter Saminko International acquired the property, okay? And soon afterwards, I was contacted to say that the deal that we had offered to, to Jerry Sanchez, Saminko International was interested in, in getting the same deal. Now, just a minute. Okay. That is not what they're saying. They're saying they bought the building not even knowing that HUD funds were available. They didn't even know that there were such HUD funds. Now, it's obvious that they didn't put the money into this building, which had to be rehabilitated. It was a crumbling, decaying, uh, unusable structure. It was a haven for the homeless and the pigeons. They were ready to renovate it. Mm -hmm. They were ready to restore it. And they're telling me on their oath, and I believe them, mm -hmm. that the city of Miami went to them and told them, we have got this HUD money. That's when they found out about the HUD money. So how could that have been an incentive to purchase the building and to announce that they will <coughs> renovate it? To tell the truth, Congressman Landis, I that's, do that's all I'm asking I you, do not to tell the truth. I do not understand the situation because I am not familiar with, 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 my, with what Mr. Nassin is saying. Uh, well, I am I not suggesting you personally suggested that there are hot funds, mm. but City of Miami officials suggested that there were hot funds after they bought the building without knowing that there are such funds. If that, if that is the case, I was not aware of that. Okay. <coughs> now that you are, um, now that you are, 
If, 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 if the question is, uh, Congressman, if the purpose of the funds were not to induce Mr. Samenko uh, to, uh, to proceed with the, with the rehab, I would have recommended completely against this project. Okay. Please proceed. With all due respect, we feel that the credibility of the program is on the line when local citizenry reads in the Miami Herald, the Miami's largest newspaper, and find that funds intended to, insist, to assist low-income neighborhoods and the businesses which serve them are being approved for use to a Saudi Arabian businessman. Those who seek the funds may say that these efforts are within the intent of the program and that the jobs that are being created or saved are for low-income persons. This statement does not hold true. These are usually short-lived, temporary jobs with no chance of continued investment, which is so greatly needed for growth in our community. In the case of the Freedom Tower, there is no day-to-day -day activity. Consequently, there are no jobs of a permanent nature. And if I might digress for just a moment, I took the opportunity to visit the area of the Freedom Tower. It was my hopes that I could go in in order that I could make an unbiased statement regarding the condition of the Freedom Tower. But I found that the Freedom Tower is a locked facility with the guard standing on the outside. We were not permitted to go in. On, there apparently is, act, is no activity whatsoever. On the north side of the Freedom Tower, there now is no care being given. It has grown up, and it looks on the north side of the Freedom Tower, it looks like any other building that might be in disrepair. If you simply walked by it, you would not know that some $5.4 million might have been spent to renovate the building. I understand that it is for private uh, circumstances that one might rent or go in, but it isn't a, a facility which is open to the general public. Now, I would feel that $5.4 million would surely have provided businesses and housing as well as jobs for areas that are far more depressed than the Freedom Tower area. I say that no matter how we explain it, the wrong message is being received. That is, there are abuses in the program that those who really should not be benefiting once again find a way to have their needs met to the exclusion of the hundreds of local entrepreneurs who really need the public assistance to remain in or establish new businesses in low-income areas. And later in the hearing, if you wish to have me expound on that, I can. It really is ironic that on the same day that the aforementioned loans were exposed in the Miami Herald, an article also appeared which indicated that a neighborhood YMCA, which provides needed services to the Liberty City area community, had to have its community development block grant pulled because it had been deemed ineligible by U.S. HUD officials. In this case, I am pleased to say that the city of Miami made a decision in the interest of the public good. However, public regulations apparently prohibit an action which has been viewed as most worthy to address local needs, and that is to renovate the Y facility rather than to build a new building. And I am pleased to commend the city of Miami for that action. Additionally, I am further distressed when I read that the Coconut Grove Playhouse received a $200,000 loan that was subsequently converted to an out and out grant with no apparent reason of distress or inability to pay the loan. I cannot but wonder if, as a result of the grant, 300 complimentary tickets issued at performances improved in any way. 
the plight of the poor and needy, while taxpayers picked up the loan tab. The Community Development Block Grant Program has numerous examples of right kinds of activity, which receive support and provide the appropriate kinds of services to address neighborhood development issues. However, special attention needs to be given to criteria for providing assistance to for-profit entities. If the program is available to address the needs of those who can really marshal other private resources to expand or create businesses, I can foresee that there will eventually be scarce dollars available to those who need the assistance as a last resort. The need for the Community Development Block Grant is evident. The manner in which it is applied to the total citizenry, I believe, is unequally balanced. It is my sincere hope that the rules and regulations will heretofore be of such application as to benefit all in order that abuses, intended or otherwise, will not he have even the slightest perception of unfairness or favoritism toward any who it is intended to benefit. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Let me go back to you, Mr. Castaneda. Now that you apparently know the facts which you didn't when you came here. Was it necessary for the city of Miami to give an investment group headed by a very wealthy Saudi Arabian businessman a 5.4 million dollar CDBG loan at 1% interest to have this project proceed? If it was not necessary to induce the development, no. Well, he says it wasn't. Per, per his statement, the answer is no. So do you then now recognize that this $5.4 million CDBG loan, HUD money, was improperly allocated? That being the case, yes. This loan to uh, the Saudi businessman was approved in December of 1987, is that correct? Originally it was approved December 10th and it went back to the commission uh, on January 14th, January 14th, 1988. It was approved on December 10, 1987. That originally? Yes, originally. Subsequent to that date, you had a public hearing, is that correct? Uh, right, on January 14. Shouldn't public participation should have come first before the approval? Definitely, de definitely, Congressman. Uh, basically, we felt at that time... Isn't that, that Ms. Range's testimony and judgment with which the chair certainly concurs? I mean, the, the people in Miami who are interested in where HUD funds go should be heard before the decision is made. The decision was made on December 10, and after the decision is made, a public hearing is held. Isn't this upside down? Congressman, I, I concur with you. We had not done this. In a, uh, we were not familiar with the process. On December 10, when it was approved, after discussion with HUD, they said no. That is improper what you have done, and we proceeded to, to call for a public hearing on January, on January 14. We entered into uh, negotiations with the agreement, and the agreement was signed on June the 29th, and the first disbursement did not occur to the 30th. You know, when once in a blue moon we have a very, very small community testifying here, one has some empathy for a very small community saying, sorry, we didn't know how di we have to do this. The city of Miami is a big city. And for, this, for the 
director of community development of the city of Miami to testify that you didn't know how to proceed with the approval of a $5.4 million taxpayer finance loan is very distressing. Congressman, we corrected the situation prior to any disbursement. I understand that, but, but what was there so complex in understanding that you should not make the approval before a public hearing? We felt that the, 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 the public hearing at the commission met that requirement. After consultation with us, we realized that we had made a mistake and we basically took the whole issue back to the commission on January the 14th with plenty of advertisement and so forth. And from, from the articles in the newspaper, you can understand that there was a lot of you know, public comment and uh, articles in the newspaper about this issue. Last fall, Mr. Castaneda, the city of Miami authorized a $5 million uh, community development block grant loan to an automobile dealership to enlarge a Rolls-Royce dealership. It appears that an invitation last fall to testify before the subcommittee about that loan, uh, coupled with some media coverage, persuaded the dealership not to take the loan. Now why was it necessary for the city of Miami to offer a Rolls-Royce dealership a $5 million HUD loan? Commissioners, going back to, to, to this map, the, the auto dealership is farther north. The city of Miami is very much interested in, in developing this whole strip heading north. And I, I know that, that, that your concern is about lending money to wealthy individuals. The problem that we have is... Well, I must, I must admit to you that, you know, when I wake up in the middle of the night, I really don't ask myself, how could we provide some 1% HUD money to a Rolls-Royce dealership? That's not my number one concern in the field of, of uh, housing in the United States or community development in the United States. Uh, I have nothing against people who can buy Rolls-Royce automobiles. That's their privilege. But I am concerned, as the chairman of the Oversight Committee with respect to HUD, to see HUD monies go into Rolls-Royce dealerships. And uh, I wonder if you understand my concern. Uh, I, I understand your concern. What the city of Miami and is trying to do is to maximize the resources available to the city of Miami. That's precisely what I think you have not done. Well, and one of the resources that is available is the community development float. If not, if we are unable to, to utilize the float, the money just sits there in the treasury of the United States and serves no purpose to the citizens of Miami. What we're trying to do is to be able... You mean the only two possible uses of community development block grants That's is to give it to a wealthy Saudi businessman or to a Rolls-Royce dealer. That, that in, in all the creative talent which is present in that great city, these were the, the, the two projects that, that suddenly came to the top. No, 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 Congressman. Uh, under community development, all the projects that we have funded benefit directly low and moderate income individuals. However, on the community development float, which is, this, which first of all, you need the ability to guarantee the letter of credit. Obviously, a person to qualify for that requires significant types of assets. In the case of the YMCA, we were able to provide the money because Northern Trust Bank was willing to guarantee the debt of the YMCA. But the point that I'm making, Congressman, is that to qualify for a float, you have to have assets in order to get the letter of credit. And that is treated somehow differently from the rest of the Community Development Block Grant Program. Let's go to the Coconut Grove. 
in connection with this $200,000 community development block grant loan to the Coconut Grove Playhouse, you were quoted as saying the following. Tell me, please, if this is an accurate quote. People who visit the Playhouse later go to eat in area restaurants. That creates jobs. End quote. Is this an accurate quote? That's correct. Well, HUD regulations state very clearly that the jobs must be created directly for low and moderate income persons and that some vague trickle-down theory of job creation doesn't satisfy that requirement. On what basis did the City of Miami make a $200,000 loan to the Coconut Grove Playhouse? Congressman, on the same basis that Congress approved, I'm sorry, that UDAC approved a $6 million grant to the City of Miami to build an amphitheater for Bayside. Mm -hmm. The amphitheater attracted people which later UDAG, on... UDAG is an entirely different program which is an entirely different set of requirements. But, but the so I, let me just tell you in case you don't know. You cannot use the requirements which are applicable to one program and use those requirements for an entirely different program. My question is a very simple one. On what basis did the City of Miami make a $200,000 loan to the Coconut Grove Playhouse? We felt that there was a direct relationship between the jobs in the restaurants surrounding the area and the Coconut Grove Playhouse. Was the, Co the Coconut Grove Playhouse in the process of closing down? They were having financial problems. Everybody's having financial problems. Were they going to close down short of this $200,000 loan? They, they were having serious financial problems. I didn't ask you that. Everybody's having serious financial problems. I if the state the state contributed $800,000 and the city contributed $200,000. The Would city didn't. The CDBG program that, did. That is correct. And, and you were not, not authorized to do that on the basis of CDBG program guidelines. My question is, what rationale did you use? What specific low and moderate income jobs were created as a result of this loan? We argue that there was a direct relationship between the job... Well, there is clearly no direct relationship because there are lots of restaurants in the area that are functioning. And, and the so at the very best, you could have argued an indirect relationship, certainly not a direct relationship. That was the position that HUD took and the city of Miami repaid the $200,000. Do you believe that HUD was correct? Yes. So the granting of the $200,000 loan was a mistake? Yes. I can't yes. hear you. Yes. Mr. Rahman, if I may ask, how much did your group pay for F Miami Freedom Tower? $8.7 million. Was that the market value? Uh, that was the asking price. It was, in fact, as I understand it, it was, uh, the market value was half that. The market value was half that. Yes. The market value was about 4.4 million. Yes, about that. 4.3 million, and That's you paid 8.7 million. Yes. Why did you pay twice as much as the market value? Well, that was the asking price, and there was another property uh, the same owner who was selling it, which was the Columbus McAllister site. The two sites together was sold. Tell us what the Columbus McAllister site is. I don't know what it is. Uh, Columbus, uh, Columbus Hotel was a famous Columbus Hotel, and there was another hotel called McAllister, uh, which was a condemned um, hotel. It's been condemned for some 15 years or so. <coughs> Um, it's here. And that is really the property you wanted to buy? Well... And this was just a sort of a tie-in arrangement? Yes. But the two together were being sold. It couldn't be separated. 
and the price for each one of them was different. How much did you pay for the Columbus McAllister property? Uh, 16.7 million, I believe. 16.7? Yes. And was that the market value? I was uh, a little higher than the market value. A little higher? 10% yeah. higher? I would say more than 10% higher. 15, 20%? About 15, 20, 25% higher. About 20, 25% higher. Now, I know you have stated this earlier, but I want to be sure that the record is perfectly clear on that, so uh, let me review it. According to your sworn testimony, Mr. Rahman, your group purchased Freedom Tower and immediately announced plans to restore it. Correct. At the time you purchased Freedom Tower, you did not know of the existence of the CDBG program. Is that Look, correct? To the best of my knowledge, our group didn't know. To the best of your knowledge, your group, your group didn't know that such a program existed. After you purchased Freedom Tower, you immediately announced that you will renovate it and restore it. Yes. That announcement came prior to your knowledge of there being CDBG loans or prior to City of Miami officials approaching you concerning such loans. To the best of my knowledge, that's correct. Very good. Is it therefore correct for me to assume that your group would have gone forward with uh, the renovation and restoration without the CDBG loan? I believe so. Thank you very much. Now, it is my understanding that a Cuban museum was to have been included as part of uh, Freedom Tower which at one time served as the processing point for thousands of Cuban, Cuban immigrants. What happened to the plans for that Cuban museum, may I ask? So, the, uh, we were supposed to provide space for a Cuban museum, which we still have. I mean, we have the space. The whole building is vacant. Uh, the issue arose as to whether we were making a donation of this space or whether somebody was going to lease it. The gentleman by the name of uh, Sanchez, he was an active member and he planned to lease it. However, he uh, faded out of the scene for some reason and the space is still there, but nobody has come forward to date to lease space from us. There was a suggestion made at one point that we buy $4 million worth of Cuban art and put it. Uh, we didn't see any <laughs> reason for doing that. But the space is available if somebody wants to open a museum. Congressman Martinez. Well, right off the bat, I'd like to know who made those suggestions that you buy $4 million worth of Cuban art? Uh, I don't remember the exact one of the commissioners suggested it. It's the same answer we got from the past administration. I don't remember. I can't recall. You know, some, you know guys are talking about conversations you had, uh, and, but nobody recalls who uh, brought forth the conversation. Isn't that strange? Uh, in your testimony, you say that you didn't know about uh, the CDG and that you were approached by the city officials, but yet you can't tell us which city officials approached you. Uh, it's uh, it, the way you put it as an approach or an offer, or what I have put down in my testimony is I suggested. And it's that suggestion, I'm not saying that somebody specifically came and says, hey, why don't you do this or do that? If somebody said that this is available if you, this kind of fund is available if you meet the criteria. So we did approach <coughs> once the information was given to us. You know, if somebody asked me to give them $4 million, because that's an extent what they're doing, saying buy $4 million worth of art so we can put it in a museum, I sure would remember who asked me to spend $4 million. I know that for a fact. Uh, if I took In it fact, if they, somebody asked me to spend $100, I'd remember who it was. <laughs> if I took it seriously, yes, I would. No, I think it's, you take it seriously. You, don't, you know, somebody asking for $4 million is very serious. The other question is that I have is that the condition you said that the city approached you about uh, the CDBG uh, monies. Uh, 
You say the city approached you, but who in the city approached you? Obviously, Mr. Castaneda doesn't know uh, who in the city approached you. He's, he said that, to his knowledge, they didn't. Uh, so somebody, you know, it just smacks of somebody covering up something here because they don't want us to really know. Uh, because knowing might put things in a little different light, uh, or maybe bring us out into the light. Sir, um, if I knew any one specific person who I could uh, say that this is it, I mean, I recall we were told, I'm not sure which of the commissioner or which city... Uh, let me read your, your yeah. statement, and this is a sworn statement, Mr. Chairman? This is a sworn statement? Yes. It doesn't say, I think, or maybe, or some uh, ambiguous person out there asked me. This is what it says. We completed the purchase of the Freedom Tower late in 1987 and immediately announced our plans to renovate and restore this historic building. Soon thereafter, soon thereafter, City of Miami officials suggested we apply for a CDBG loan to finance part of the restoration cost. Very definitely it says City Miami officials. Who were the City Miami officials? Uh, you don't remember uh, they because they weren't serious about it. I, I don't remember. I, I don't remember. You don't remember. remember. The they weren't serious about it. And it was $5 million. We don't take those kinds of things seriously. No, uh, I didn't say that. What I said that four Well, somebody asked you to buy $4 million worth of art and you didn't take that seriously. Yes. What's the difference between $4 million and $5 million? It's $1 million. When you get into the millions, I don't think $1 million is much of a difference. That's correct. And here again, we don't know who, who suggested that to us. And here again, we don't know the city of Miami officials. But you're, you're the one that's saying it. Yeah. You're the one that's saying it, not somebody out there. This is very definite, a sworn testimony. You say, city, if I didn't know who approached us, I sure as heck wouldn't say it in a sworn statement. I would have said, somebody suggested that we approach the city about the loan. I don't know who. That would have been the more accurate statement. This says, city, definitely, city of Miami officials suggested we apply for the CDBG loan. That's what it says. It does. Indeed, it does. Who are the uh, Miami officials that approached you? So we might know. I, you know. If you are asking me at this point of time to tell you specifically, I can rattle off all the names of the city officials, but I'm not quite sure who exactly in person made that suggestion. Uh, Mr. Castaneda, in your, your prepared document here, uh, you say the same thing. Uh, well, no, you say differently. You say, and here again, this is sworn testimony, you say, in 1986, uh, well, no, excuse me, I got the wrong place here. Uh, the uh, $5.4 million loan was judged to be necessary and appropriate to induce the Zamico and to induce. Here we've heard, heard Mr. Raman tell the chairman that they didn't need to be induced, that they were going to go ahead with the project, but you say you needed to induce them to uh, go ahead uh, and renovate this blighted uh, building that had been abandoned for 15 years. Uh, were there no projects out there and none applying for that money? Because uh, that uh, hasn't been made clear to me. Were there no projects out there that were applying for money uh, that would have been as meritorious as this? Uh, other than, I understand, and I, because I come from uh, local city government, and I understand, and we, we did a lot of redevelopment agencies in our city to, to take blighted areas out and uh, to uh, restore some economic growth to the community and all that. I understand, and I see your beautiful plan, and you get a beautiful plan like that in front of you, and you certainly want to see it, the dream of that fulfilled, and you can see little places here and here, and you can see how you can best utilize money especially in this case federal money, in a way to complete that beautiful picture. But if there are private investors that can go ahead and do that anyway, that money shouldn't be used that way. Of course not. And so in, uh, in the enthusiasm to complete this beautiful picture that you've held up here a couple of times, uh, is it possible that uh, best judgment wasn't used in going ahead and financing people that could have financed themselves, as in this case, and then... Uh, the question is, what compounds that uh, 
in at least some of our minds is the fact that there may have been projects out there that uh, could have used this money and would have done a lot more towards the objectives of the money. Were there other projects or were there no projects and you had to find some place to spend the money? Let, let, me, let, me, let me answer your question in two parts. Uh, first of all, I, I was never aware of the statements that Nassim has made here today. Uh, it was always my impression that this money was needed to cause its development to take place. On, on the second issue, the, the, the whole CD float concept, it, it is a very tricky concept because you need letters of credit you need letters of credits from approved bank, and uh, if, excuse me. Let's let's clear that up right now. The uh, Department of HUD does not require that. They they encourage it, but sure. they do not require it. But the city of Miami, in their development plans, require right. it. Right. So if the city of Miami required it, although HUD encouraged it, not required it, the city in order to move projects that would more benefit uh, low and moderate income people and more uh, eliminate true blight than add to a beautiful picture, uh, could have waived that because it was within their power to waive it. <coughs> All right? Well, uh, Congressman, I can also show you uh, Inspector General reports in which they question high default rates. So, so, you know, here cities are being accused of, of being too careful, and then sometimes they're accused of being not too careful. And, uh, you know, it's a kind of, you know, touchy type of situation. You know, I, I can show you uh, numerous documents in which HUD has said, we believe that you should have letters of credits, and there are a lot of very good reasons why that should be the case. And for that matter, they also have prepared documents saying, with the qualities of the bank and uh, the, the kinds of banks that you should be dealing with and, and so forth. So, I, I, you know, I, I think well, cities presume you know, that that is... If you're saying that it's a question of er making an error, and I would suggest that we make an error on the side of those who it would most help to begin with, because what we've done here is made an error on the side of people that didn't need the help. And so if you have your choice, I would say as a conscientious public servant that we're going to take a chance on the on a project that we think will be successful. We always try to do that. Okay. We always might try to make sure. And there are other ways other than the letter of credit to guarantee the success of a project because that's happened in many places. You're correct. But I, I ask again, the main question is, were there other projects that this money could have been used for? At None the time? that could have provided letters of credit to support no, that. No, no, that, that wasn't my question. Yeah. And my question was, were there other projects that have, could have used this money? The city of Miami, on, on any normal process, has about $36 million of projects applying for $13 million. So we, we do not have uh, too few projects to apply. However, you know, we have always felt that the CD float was only for a very sure thing type of thing, and if not, we couldn't use it. Yeah. And, and that, that has been the attitude. Well, th there have been instances, too, that maybe you would have been wise to take some of those other projects and found some... Uh, 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 bank or not, uh, financial institution that would have themselves uh, guaranteed the loan because that's happened in, mm -hmm. in these kinds of projects. And it would have been of a lot better use of the funds. Um, the chairman has been pretty extensive in his questioning and, and I don't think he's going to get much more, any of us are going to get much more than, than he was able to get. Uh, but uh, I'm interested uh, uh, in uh, Ms. Range in the your testimony about going, supposedly this was to eliminate blight and it has done that, and yet you said you went behind the building and it looks in, in, uh, very much in a state of disrepair and, and really in said, that part of it the blight hasn't been eliminated? I said on the north side, the side of the building. Let me make it very clear that there is a very beautiful, well-planted parking lot to the rear of the building. However, on the north side, which is exposed to the public, uh, driving south on Biscayne Boulevard, uh, that portion of the building looks like it is in complete disrepair, and I'm sure the representatives will agree to that. It's very near a railroad track. It has grown up. I think there may be an old vehicle there, if I'm not mistaken, and it gives every indication that there is no activity going on. On the Biscayne Boulevard side of the building, there are huge front doors which are uh, barred, locked, I suppose, from the inside, you cannot gain entrance. And then as you come down six, the 6th Street side, those windows do not show any 
indication of beauty or improvement from the outside. As I said to you, I could not gain entrance to the building, so I cannot give an unbiased account as to what it looks like on the inside. Mr. Mr. Rahman, uh, is this work that's not been completed yet that you intend to complete? Um, sir, the north side, the boundary wall of Freedom Tower, where the building edge is, is the boundary wall. However, we've leased some 300 feet from the uh, Florida East Coast Railway to make a little driveway. That's where the boundary, boundary of Freedom Tower now on the northern side ends. Beyond that boundary is the railway track, and beyond that railway track there's some other properties. She's right that other property is in the process of being demolished. It belongs to someone else. It doesn't belong to Freedom Tower. Uh, the building from the front is closed because the building is vacant. And we cannot just leave the front door open with nobody coming in or going out. We have no way of controlling security if somebody wants to sneak in. But if somebody comes into the back of the building where there is a security guard, anybody can come in and see it. We don't encourage uh, people just coming in to see the building. If somebody lets us know they would like to see the building, we certainly show them. Yeah. Ms. Rangel, uh, am I hearing you wrong? Uh, he's saying, he's seeming to say that the building itself, the Freedom Tower itself, on the back side, has not got a distressed look to it. Uh, are you saying that the Freedom Tower or another property? No, no, the Freedom Tower itself on the back side, which uh, I believe faces Northeast 2nd Avenue, has a very beautiful parking lot which is planted and it looks and apparently is kept up. What I'm saying to you is that on the north side, as far as my recollection goes, abutting the building, it does not appear to have any distance between the building and the debris of which I speak. The grass and uh, just a, a complete state of disrepair is right against the building. So it does not occur to me, or it does not appear, that there is some distance of 300 feet, which is well cared for, and then, uh, and then a dilapidated condition. The Freedom Tower itself looks like it's in disrepair on the north side, the abutting the building. The reason I ask that question is because we spent $5.4 million of taxpayers' money to rehabilitate a facility that don't, doesn't seem to be completely rehabilitated. Mr. Castaneda, do you know about this condition? Because after all, it was your yeah. agency that... The, bu the building was rehabbed. I, I do not know if uh, what she's referring, that somebody has placed graffiti on the building? Or no, no, it's not graffiti. It's natural growth. It's just like you uh, didn't cut your lawn for uh, six months or a year. What you said, That's the building like. itself looked in deterioration. Yes, the building itself on that side. Well, I'm, I'm speaking of the surrounding area, abutting the building, just as if we were just against that, uh, your desk there. And there was uh, grass and trees and debris in general. Right up against the building, there does not appear to be some 300 feet, and then this disrepair. The disrepair appears right on the grounds of what I would consider the building. So this is within the property limits of the freedom or no, not? Sir. No, sir. It cannot be. Because on the northern side, we have a wire mesh fence because... Up FEC against the building? No, no, no. It's How far back from the building? Uh, about... It uh, would be about 12, 15 feet oh, from the Oh, she's saying building. it's against the building, so it would be on your property. No. And so much Beyond, for uh, on the northern, light. On the northern border of the building is a wire mesh fence and a gate because the FEC will not allow us to put a permanent structure or building there. Yeah, it's, it. this is the, the, the northern side, uh, assuming this is Biscayne Boulevard, the northern side would be this side here. So some 15 feet we've leased from FEC. And that, there's a wire fence. And the parking lot is on this side. Beyond that fence is the railway track, which is, goes to uh, services the port once a month. 
Beyond that is a Hertz property, which was uh, used by Hertz Rental. They abandoned it, and now I recently they've started demolishing the structure there. So there is no area around Freedom Tower, adjacent next to the Freedom Tower, or the building itself. There's no way it is uh, in state of disrepair. May I add, this, this is the north side. Yeah, is that is correct? North, yeah. This is the area of which I speak. This is the area that shows, I'm not speaking of disrepair of the building itself, of the construction of the building. I'm speaking of the, of the surrounding area of the building. Just as I said before, it's just as if you didn't care for a part of your property. I made it quite clear that on the back of the building where the parking lot is, it is a very, very fine uh, parking lot. It's, it has trees, it has bumpers, it has everything that one would desire in a parking lot, and that is within the confines of a wall and fence. But here on the front, side on the front north side of the building is that portion of which I speak. Thank you. And I've seen it only that one time that I went there and if if I am wrong in my assumption then I stand corrected but this is what I saw when I was there less than a week ago. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the most basic part of it, not really the main purpose of this kind of money, was to eliminate blight. And if there is a condition there after having spent that kind of money, I would think it would be incumbent on the city of Miami to follow up and make sure that uh, if we're in, in the last defense talking uh, of justifying this particular use of monies, then you ought to make sure that at least that portion, the blight portion, is taken care of. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Makeley. If you have an introductory statement or question. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have a statement which I'll uh, submit for the record with, with your approval. Objection. And uh, I do have just several brief questions. I apologize for not being here for all the testimony. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask this, and if it has been asked and is clear, uh, I apologize, but I think it's critical for the record. Uh, Mr. Castaneda, uh, as I understand, you can give the CBDG monies for basically three purposes. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the purpose that you granted this money for? Slum and blight removal. And did that uh, restoration of the Freedom Tower remove the blight? Yes. Why then did you call that money back? Oh, because at that time there were some problems with the bank. BCCI was the, 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 the holding company for, for was the, the bank holding the letter of credit. We, um, I believe that uh, th that week in July 1990, uh, the bank, uh, bank officers were arrested in Tampa. Uh, there was a question as to whether they were going to lose their license. And because of that action, uh, we moved to, to call the letter of credit. So you called the letter of credit because of nothing to do with the handling of the HUD distribution no. of monies or regulations no. or it, procedures. It was the safety of, of, of the letter of credit. It was strictly based on the security agreement which had been drafted with the letter of credit as collateral. That's correct. And uh, there was no, no uh, contest on that? It, we had a 48-hour call provision for any reason at all. Okay. And uh, were there other projects which were competing for this uh, C CDBG monies? Well. The, the, that's what has been discussed prior. Uh, I think uh, Congressman Martinez raised the issue, uh, and, I, and I was explaining to him that uh, city floats are comprised basically uh, of the funds that the uh, that the cities have on their in their letters of credit. Um, though those funds are committed to other particular projects, and therefore the idea is to to find an interim use for that money, uh, but it has to be fully secured and available for that other particular project when the time comes. Because of that, you require letters of credit, or, or I suggest that you should have letters of credit, and it becomes very difficult to utilize or, or for cities to be able to take advantage you know, of that capacity. Yeah. That creates a problem. Uh, Mr. Uh, Raman, when you purchased this building for $8.7 million, 
with which which was, as I understand, double the market value. Correct. Uh, was this, uh, in your minds as investors, a good investment, or were you uh, at the time uh, just thinking you were helping to uh, get rid of a uh, slum area? Uh, it wasn't regarded as a good investment. It didn't make economic sense. However, it did give us a sense of history as being part of Miami, and this is definitely a part of Miami. We have a lot of commitment in the city of Miami. So this was our way of getting involved more with the city of Miami and in the hope that we might in the long run make some money too. So your original purchase had nothing to do with the CDBG monies. You no. were looking at it as a commitment. Yes. Uh, and I've looked at your brochure, which is uh, quite fr frankly very attractive, but I have never been there and I understand that the area is still perhaps not an attractive business area and that may account for why there are no tenants in, in your building. Uh, was that part of your business plan that you said after sinking uh, 8.7 million into a building, we will still be left in a neighborhood that uh, has uh, not much incentive to have uh, 150 multinational companies, if you, as you indicate, come into our building? That's true, but uh, the city of Miami is going towards north, and uh, in recent time there are plans to have the Performing Arts Center just opposite Freedom Tower. The port is becoming, Bayside has become very active. Now you have the mass transit people mover coming with a station, Freedom Tower station. So we believed in the long run this will be a, a central point uh, of Miami downtown development uh, projects. And we had that sense of believing in it. At this point of time, there isn't enough infrastructure to support an office building. Uh, when people work in an office, they want to get out and go somewhere to eat. Or so there isn't that infrastructure yet. But uh, we have Dade Community College, which is one block away, two blocks away. They're expanding. So there is hope for that area. I mean, there is hope for that building. And we believed and looked at it, and that is spirit. In the meantime, we are carrying it. We are living with it. Without the CDBG monies, you're doing it on your own? Oh, yes. Well, I'm reminded of the person who bought all the land around what is now South Station in Boston at the time. He was thought to have been crazy. Uh, obviously, he became a very wealthy individual when South Station in Boston went into that area. So I hope that uh, things work out for the city of Miami. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Makley. Uh, we will now turn to Miss um, Mary Ann Arty, Chairwoman, Delaware County Council, Delaware County, uh, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> we appreciate your patience. Uh, your prepared statement will be entered in the record in its entirety and you may proceed any way you choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'm Mary Ann Artie. I chair Delaware County Council in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Council is, uh, would be the same as county commissioners in most of the other counties in Delaware County, although we operate under a home rule charter form of county government. I have four elected colleagues, and we are responsible for the administration of a county of 49 towns and nearly 600,000 people. Delaware County geographically lies in the southeasternmost corner of Pennsylvania. Our communities, our towns, range from being poor and urban to being affluent and suburban. Our people are a mix of blue collar, hard hat, middle management, professional men and women. We have a strong, skilled labor force. We have many institutions of higher education that are nationally, internationally known. And we have a wealth of health care facilities. We have many treasures and we have some warts. From 1975 until 1989, Delaware County received approximately $58,470,000 in CDBG funds. And during these years, the county CDBG program was administered by a subgrantee, the Delaware County Redevelopment Authority. And that was an autonomous entity uh, outside of county government, although county council appointed their board. And they contracted with some various subgrantees to carry out eligible programs. 
The Delaware County Partnership for Economic Development was another autonomous entity, but was a subgrantee of the RDA from 1983 until 1989. The partnership then handed all, handled all county economic development programs, including those that were funded through the CDBG program. From 1975 through 1989, the RDA was the subject of regular monitoring reviews by the program staff of the Philadelphia Regional Office of HUD. And during those 14 years, the RDA's various municipal housing economic development programs under CDBG were most successful. And they provided the intended beneficiaries of the program with efficiently delivered service. The partnership, which is a subject of most of the comments today, was unique. It was an organization of representatives of business and government and education and labor. And they were brought together in the early 1980s to preserve the jobs and to keep the economy of the county. There had been some forecast of a downturn in the economy of, of our county because of the uh, uh, industrial base that we were losing and the, the uh, factory jobs that we were losing in, in the county. And sadly, it had many achievements, but sadly those achievements, as you know, have been marred. The programs have been, the program has been the subject of an audit by HUD. And I thought perhaps that one of the things that you might need to know outside of my statement was the fact that uh, under our Home Rule Charter form of county government, the five members of council divide the responsibilities of county government. And we have, as you know, many, many departments. There's no, nearly 2,600 employees of county government. Traditionally, the person who chaired the council had the oversight for the CDBG programs, the partnership, and the redevelopment authority. I was elected to council in 1988, and we served four-year terms. And in 1989, the person who was then chairman resigned to go on to other endeavors. And the gentleman who was vice chairman became the chairman, and I became the vice chairman. And as such, became a member of the Partnership for Redevelopment Authority, along with the chairman. In January of 1990, the person who was chairman of council term ended, and I became the chair of Delaware County Council and therefore have assumed uh, uh, much of the things that we are dealing with today. It has been a, an interesting experience, Mr. Chairman, and we find ourselves uh, in many difficulties. We have had some legal pursuits. We have had the person who had been the uh, director of the partnership um, when a task force on which I served, as a matter of fact, I served as chair in the late 18, 1989, found that there were some irregularities in the partnership. And we had a consultant, and we met with another group of people and, and came in and looked at some of those irregularities that had surfaced. And as a result of that, issued a report. And that report went to, to HUD. And the person who was then the director was asked to leave, he did leave. He has been subsequently indicted. Uh, he pleaded guilty. He has yet to be sentenced. They came to light in July of 1989 when an uh, employee of the partnership uh, questioned or raised an issue about the awarding of contracts. And that's, in turn, what created the development of the partnership. We have been found wanting by an audit of HUD from the Inspector General, the Regional Inspector, Gen Regional Inspector General for Audit, uh, did a comprehensive audit which was released about July of 1990, June, July. And since that time, and even before that time, if you will, we have been about the business of putting our house to order. As I mentioned, we asked the 
person who was then the executive director to uh, resign. He did. Uh, we reorganized the uh, partnership and brought it in to direct oversight of county government from being a, a, a subgrantee directly. It's still a subgrantee, but we brought it directly under the auspices of, of Delaware County Council. It is now known as the uh, Economic Development Oversight Board. And uh, all five members of that oversight board have been uh, uh, reviewed uh, by HUD and found to be free of any kind of conflict of interest or any other nefarious deeds in their past or future. Uh, we have a member of council, the vice chairman of council, Ward Williams, works directly with that group and is indeed a part of it, but because of HUD directives could not serve as a member, but he serves as an ex officio member and is uh, part of their everyday business of being. We have taken the redevelopment authority, which was a subgrantee, and we have brought it into county government so that we have a direct line to what it is and what it's doing and where it is going. It's part now of our planning department. And the planning department reports directly to our county's executive director, who, who sits behind me here. The only chore that was left that is required by law for the redevelopment authority in our form of county government is that it have the, uh, the right of condemnation and that we had to keep that right. So we vested the members of the Economic Development Oversight Board, the EDOB, if you will, with that legal responsibility. But that is all that then remains of what was the RDA or the Redevelopment Authority. We have had an experience, if you will, of going back and reconstructing and redoing all, with all possible measure uh, of everything that had been questioned in the audit from the Inspector General. Uh, the going has been difficult, Mr. Chairman. I, I readily admit that. But we are working very industriously to achieve that end. We had, I think, 44 loans that accounted for part of the $5,641,000 that uh, we have been found lacking by the rig audit. And incidentally, we, we, we challenge those numbers and, and uh, we, we uh, expect fully to, uh, uh, with some exceptions, to uh, clear all of those findings, sir. But some of the 44 loan files, and I think 30, some of those files are now ready to be cleared. They're prepared, they're ready, they're ready for the people from HUD to uh, uh, go over them. They have been submitted previously and found lacking and that the process was not to HUD's requirements. Um, and some of the other monies we have repaid. Um, we will, the executive director who is no longer with, with us was bonded and insured and we hope to um, uh, recover some of the money uh, that we found that uh, was a result of some of the purchases and things that were uh, done with HUD money that was certainly not right and from day one we have conceded the fact that they were not proper but we hope to recover that money from the bonding and the insuring and indeed the uh, gentleman has yet to be sentenced I think that comes at the end of this month sometime and we have written to the uh, US Attorney and asked that restitution of these funds be made part of the sentencing procedure so that we are, in every way, Mr. Chairman, putting our house to order. Uh, we have had difficulties, and it's taken a long while, and it's going to take some time longer. But we will, in every way, make every effort to clear the entire findings and deeply regret that they occurred. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Art. I appreciate your very uh, candid and, and full statement. May I begin by asking, um, you've been a member of the Delaware County Council since January 
1988 as well as a member of the board of the Delaware County Partnership for Economic Development. Is that correct? Well, that would have occurred in probably 1989, Mr. Congressman, when I became vice chairman. Right, right. Or vice chair, or when the chairman left and people kind of moved up. Right. And now, it appears to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, it appears to me that if a particular individual had not gone to the press alleging improprieties, which was the catalyst for the HUD Inspector General's audit, which found that millions of dollars in community development block grant funds had been misused, it's very likely that these abuses would have continued to go undetected. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I think that some of these things had been unearthed by some of the people within the Economic Development Partnership Board and were brought to our attention, which is a point at which we asked the consultant to do a monitoring review of the, of the uh, uh, partnership. On the heels of, you're, you're talking about procurement of contracts? Yes. Well, my understanding, and you are much closer to it, so please correct me if I'm wrong, that the catalyst for this whole problem, the revelation of the whole problem, was an individual who went to the press alleging improprieties. Is that correct? That could have been. And am I correct in assuming I'm, I'm that... Not I'm, I just really can't be totally sure of that, Mr. Chairman, but historically I think that uh, uh, there was contact with the press, whether it was someone from outside the partnership or within the partnership, I, I cannot say. May I ask, were you present at any county council or partnership board or other meeting where there were discussions about the propriety of using CDBG funds for a particular project or activity? I think not. I was only present at a few meetings, Mr. Chairman, at the end of uh, uh, 1989 and before we dissolved that board, which would have been in 1990. I have the minutes of those meetings, but I, I do not recall uh, the issue of impropriety. After the, the Inspector General's report was issued, you were quoted in the Philadelphia Inquirer on June 16, 1990, making the following comment, and I quote, they're really going overboard because of the problem on a federal level. They find a place to hit, they will land and hit. We are going to make every effort to do whatever it is we can do to discredit this report." End quote. Is this an accurate quote? Could be, yes, sir. Do you believe that uh, um, this is in fact what uh, the Inspector General does? Quote, um, and I do remember making it, but I also remember the shock at having received that audit report from the Inspector General. I also recall some of the very uncomfortable situations that surrounded what should have been an exit interview that was not. Um, certainly it was a shock to all of us, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't question that. I could that. have overreacted. Okay, well, we all do from time to time. Lord knows. But now that, uh, now that uh, we have had an occasion to reflect on it and time has passed, do you really still maintain the position, and I'm quoting you, we're going to make every effort to do whatever it is we can, we can do to discredit this report? 
or do you rather want to see whether the report is accurate and if the report is accurate would you not rather prefer to correct the abuses? Absolutely. I think we have corrected the abuses. We have put our house to water. We continue to do that. Now we must resolve the financial findings in that audit report, Mr. Chairman, and, and, and to make sure that they are done and they are over and that we do indicate that those expenditures were made and were made with it properly and those which we're not we will deal with but I think we can resolve the whole issue other than what we have already acknowledged was wrong and have repaid are you at this stage sort of prepared to agree with me that the inspector general does his job when he goes into programs investigates these programs and makes public the improprieties of these programs? Mr. Chairman, uh, the Inspector General, I am sure, does what he needs to do and does it uh, in proper fashion. We, it's just up to us now to come back and say that these findings we do not agree with and we will resolve the issue that caused them. Okay. Well, let me show you copy of a booklet, very attractive booklet, I might add, entitled A Graphic History of Delaware County, <coughs> 17th to the 20th century. I must say, as a historian, I particularly enjoyed reading about uh, the colonial period um, in your use this brochure for school children was a misuse of community development block grant funds. Mr. Chairman, that was a loan. The, well, loan, has, let me, the loan has been repaid. Let me, <coughs> let me ask the question on the terms you define. Was that a proper loan? Is it proper to use community development block grant programs to print an admittedly very attractive historical brochure distributed in the schools of your area? On what basis was that loan made? May I confer with counsel just a you moment, surely Mr. May. Chairman? You surely may. Mr. Chairman, Council reminds me that that was a self-loan uh, made with the notion that it would be repaid. What kind of a loan? A self-loan. What's a sub-loan? That's how it was described. As a loan between county agencies. As a loan between county agencies. Uh, it was also the subject of a um, well, indictment. Uh, allow, me, allow, me to yes, sir. allow me to, and you're perfectly free to consult with counsel. And yes. If counsel wants to sit up at the table, we'll be happy to have I'd be him. happy to have him. <coughs> Will may you I please... Pre uh, may I present Mr. Uh, Alvin Ackerman, the Assistant County Solicitor, Delaware County. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly, you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to offer is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please be seated. <coughs> My question is a very simple one, and I'm delighted to have either of you folks answer it. <coughs> On what basis did you have authority to lend $68,000 for the printing of a multicolored brochure distributed in the schools on the history of Delaware County. And let me stipulate that I think it's a fine brochure. I think the school children probably learned a great deal. I think it's a, it's a meritorious project. But for the life of me, I cannot conceive how HUD funds can be used for this project or how HUD funds can be loaned for this project. Now explain to me 
the basis of the authority or tell me that it was in fact improper. With your permission, sir, uh, let me start by saying it was improper. Uh, okay, I don't need to hear more. That's all I am <coughs> I'm interested in. So the 60, the, well, could, could you talk into the mic? The $68,000 use of HUD funds to make a loan for an educational brochure was an improper use of HUD funds. That is your testimony? If it is in fact an educational brochure and we have since so determined, then it was an improper use well, of Well, what other funds. kind of brochure would this be? It uh, was originally it's a lovely, colorful brochure going back to the 17th century, showing sailing ships, and it was distributed, I take it, to school children. It was, sir. Well, it, it was <coughs> not expected on the part of anybody, I take it, that the school children will make big investments in the county, which then will produce low-income jobs. I mean, okay. it was a worthwhile educational project having nothing to do with what HUD funds are appropriated for by the Congress of the United States. Is it, that correct? It was originally proposed, Mr. Lantos, as a economic development brochure which through the school children would be disseminated to their parents. The result of that brochure, and I quite agree with you, it is, is that it is not in fact an economic development brochure. It's a historical booklet if it's anything. And based upon that, sir, after the fact, it is an improper and was an improper use of HUD funds. The county, as grantee, in its first res very first response to the inspector general, agreed that it was an improper use, agreed to repay the money, and has repaid the money. Well, you know, I can be very sympathetic to sort of borderline cases where you really don't know whether a brochure is educational or designed for economic development. Allow me to read from the brochure at the beginning. The 17th century was a period of exploration and colonization of the New World by the major European nations, England, France, Spain, Holland, and Sweden. What is now Delaware County was inhabited by the Leni Lenape Indians. In 1643, the Swedes under Governor Johann Prince made the first permanent settlement in what was to become Pennsylvania. On Tinicum Island, now Delaware County, the Swedes lived peaceably beside the Indians. In 1650, which I'm pleased to note, in 1655, the region passed to the control of the Dutch, who in 1664 relinquished all possessions in the New World to the English, who had just defeated them in a war. The English, who had colonized most of the land along the Atlantic coast, began to settle their newly acquired territory. To repay a debt owed, the family of William Penn, King Charles II of England, on March 4, 1681, granted Penn a large tract of land which was called Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods, sailing from England, etc., etc. Now, with all due respect to all of you, I don't think, and there is a beautiful picture here, multicolored, of Delaware County in the 17th century. This is not an economic development brochure. Absolutely is And not. there was never any doubt that it was an economic development <coughs> brochure. And the loan was, as you state, improper, and I want to move on to the next item. The okay. Partnership for Economic Development paid, paid $60,000 of CDBG funds to produce an eight-minute videotape promoting the county. In examining that payment, it appears that the partnership paid $18,000 extra to have the work done on an expedited basis to assure that the video was ready by September. Why was that? And was that a proper use of CDBG funds? Go ahead. You have an answer to hmm? I don't have an answer. We're not prepared to answer that for you, Mr. Congressman. Neither Mrs. Artie or I have direct knowledge. However, uh, we will get it and supply it to the committee.
Well, did the task force ha have any findings on that $18,000 expedited uh, uh, matter? I mean, I the Delaware County lived without this uh, film for 400 years. What was the urgency of getting it done by September? I can't answer your question. Mrs. Artie tells me that she can't either, but as I say, we, submit will, it for the we will try to submit it for the record, sir. Now, the Inspector General issued a report in June 1990, and that report finds the Delaware County Partnership misspent over $5 million and recommended that the program repay HUD some $1.6 million in CDBG funds. Is that correct? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, I sir. Could, could you speak into the mic? Yes, sir. Now, to date, the county has only repaid, repaid $461,000. The $1.2 million of disallowed expenses includes everything from $66,000 for unnecessary consultants to first-class air travel to view the rollout of a Boeing aircraft in Dallas. Uh, to over $2,000 to print maps of the county. Why almost two years later has this money not been repaid? We have, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Congressman, we have worked very diligently in an effort to clear some of these findings to pay the cost of those that we admitted were, were wrong, but to go time by time by time and piece by piece in order to get the pieces put together. I have had on my coffee table in my office, Mr. Chairman, a, a, a pile of papers that high that have been submitted to HUD. We have made many visits to the regional office. We have asked numerable, innumerable times for more help because what we were submitting apparently was found to be faulty or lacking in, in what they were looking for. Uh, I mean no disrespect and I know that everyone has problems but sometimes Folks know what they want, but they have a difficulty in transposing that, those needs and wants to the people that have to supply them. Uh, it has not been an easy chore. Uh, I don't say that it's an impossible chore, and I, I, I assure you, I promise you, I pledge to you that we are working in that direction, and we are doing it every day. The folks, uh, some of whom are here, are part of the team of people who have been trying to clear these findings with HUD and the program people at, at HUD in the regional office on a nearly a day-by-day -day basis so that it, it really is so time-consuming and it has taken so much in terms of effort and energy and uh, indeed, sir, frustration uh, and perhaps away from some of the things that, you know, some of us have our own agenda and the things that we want to accomplish. I but we are in the process. I think that uh, even as we speak, there should be the findings that I mentioned previously of some of the loan files. It should be cleared very shortly, and that's what, nearly $2 million. Well, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and there is no doubt in my mind that you, you have we will, goodwill we, and full intention. It, it, it's been done it in, the, in absolutely good faith, Mr. Chairman, absolutely good faith. I appreciate that. Our Chief of Staff has a question. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Artie, in July 1989, the Council appointed a special local task force to yes. investigate irregularities yes. in CDBG funding. Yes. Who headed that task I force? Did. Who did the primary work on that the, task uh, force? The consultant for the RDA, RDA who was Mr. Anthony Dunleavy. Uh, he did the actual hands-on work. Had Mr. Dunleavy done any prior work for the partnership in the HUD consulting area? Yes. 
And was it supposedly his function while he was doing the HUD consulting to be uh, aware of possible non-competitive bids for contracts uh, and other irregularities and other regulations of HUD not being followed? Was that part of his job when he was working as a HUD consultant prior to the time he was appointed to do the work on your investigative task force? I would assume so. Does that seem to you like the is that a totally disinterested bystander to do the investigative work, someone who was directly involved in the partnership and who should have been monitoring whether HUD rules and regulations were being complied with? Sir, I, I'm sorry, I, I do not know your name. Stuart Weisberg. Uh, Mr. Weisberg, uh, Mr. Dunleavy was the person with the technical knowledge. He was the person that had the, the perspective, the historical perspective, the knowledge, the background, the information to do the kind of work that we ask him to do. But now when the HUD Inspector General comes in and does its audit, yes. it finds that several hundred thousand dollars which had been paid to Mr. Dunleavy for consultant's fees were for, done for, work, for unnecessary work. Is that correct? Those were the findings, and we hope to clear those findings, sir. And that's the same individual who you hire to investigate whether there had been any irregularities in the uh, operations of the partnership, particularly with respect to use of CDBG funds. Just, just one sure. Moment. Would you give sure. us a moment? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Council reminds me that Mr. Dunleavy was retained to act in that capacity long before the uh, audit report was received, the audit findings. Right, but he had been involved in the work of the, of the partnership, and he was the one who was supposed to be monitoring whether HUD regulations were being complied with. It just seems you know, ludicrous to have that same individual do your investigation as to whether there were irregularities in the operation of the partnership. It was not a disinterested bystander. May sure. we? Sure, sure. Have all the timeouts you want. Um, Council reminds me that we do not completely agree with the Inspector General's findings and and which are, are a fault of of Mr. Dunleavy uh, and others. Thanks. Um, uh, and that's one of the issues that we expect to resolve. On what basis don't you believe, with, don't you agree with the Inspector General's findings with respect to Mr. Dunleavy? That the uh, consulting fees were uh, ill-advised. Right. What, what, what is your is argument that your, to justify? Yes. What is the argument to justify the consulting fees? And is that your argument or is that Mr. Dunleavy's argument? No, that's our argument, Mr. Weisberg. But did Mr. Dunleavy prepare the responses to the Inspector General's audit report? Partially. Okay, so he could have so had a role have... in preparing the response to the allegation that funds paid to him were misspent for unnecessary work. I understand where, you, where you're going, Mr. Weisberg, but you have to remember that Mr. Dunleavy had been the advisor, had been the consultant to the CDBG program for many, many years. He had the technical information. He had the historical perspective and the background of information and knowledge. Okay, this is not just you know, the fox guarding the chicken coop, okay. but then inviting it back for dessert, it seems. I understand. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Well, Mr. I want to, please, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dunleavy was indicted uh, on what? Some type of uh, Yeah, I forget by. On the fraudulent use of federal funds and, and went to trial, and that's another thing that has mm. been of great concern to us, uh, all the legal involvements that have incurred from this entire uh, business, not just the particular episode, but the entire thing, and was, fa and was acquitted by a jury of his peers last week. We want to thank all <laughs> five of you, ladies and gentlemen. You have been patient and responsive. The subcommittee is appreciative. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Our next uh, witness is Ms. Pam Hyde, Director, Department of Housing and Human Services in the City of Seattle, Washington. <coughs>
you kindly stand, raise your right hands. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to offer is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. Please be seated. <coughs> Ms. Hyde, we are very pleased to have you, if you would be so kind and identify the lady with you. Mr. Chairman, um, the person with me is Mary Jean Ryan. She is uh, soon to be the director of the Economic Development Project for the City of Seattle, which I will explain in a moment. We are, we are pleased to have you, Ms. Ryan. May I request uh, that uh, you try to summarize your testimony. We will enter in the record your entire prepared statement, but since we still have a long ways to go today, it uh, would be very helpful if you could summarize whatever you have to say. Mr. Chairman, hello. My name is Pamela Hyde. I'm director of the De Seattle's Department of Housing and Human Services. I'm before you today on behalf of Seattle's Mayor Norm Rice to address your questions regarding Seattle's Neighborhood Business Development Loan Program. Um, as you indicated, written testimony was provided uh, to your office last week. Seattle began operating this program in 1984 under a prior administration. As a result of a major reorganization of city operations, I have had oversight responsibility for the city's administration of block grant funds for about two and a half months since January of 1992. Due to city organizational changes and attempts to address documentation issues, uh, the numbers and information for the 46 loans are a work in progress and some of the numbers are estimates, so I wanted to be clear about that, both in the written testimony and in the oral testimony. The business loan program is one of many that we fund with block grant funds, and it represents only about 1 to 2 percent of our entire block grant program. Unlike many other jurisdictions, Seattle has not focused its block grant programs on physical infrastructure. Rather, we have exhibited a leadership role in using these funds to be meet both national and local area benefit objectives, such as the funding of services for people who are homeless, the provision of housing and child care, and other programs that provide direct services to residents who have low to moderate incomes. The business loan program is no exception. The loans, which are generally capped at $25,000 each, provide for the startup or expansion of small businesses in three Seattle neighborhoods. These neighborhoods are targeted because they have high unemployment rates and contain the most households with low to moderate income levels. By definition, these small businesses are risky and do not qualify for conventional financing, but provide needed economic vitality and jobs for residents of these communities. Restaurants, markets, jewelry and clothing stores, beauty shops, auto repair shops are among the many small businesses supported with these loans. I'd like to make it clear at the outset that Seattle has not in any way misused the block grant dollars devoted to this program. The program has created jobs and it has assisted these small businesses to start up or to remain competitive. The program has provided employment for over 160 people at least 70% uh, of which are low to moderate income. In addition, many of these loans could have qualified as local area benefit and therefore not required to justify jobs creation. However, we have done that. 80% of the loans are current or have made payments in the last 90 days, and the remaining 20% have either been referred to our law department or are being reviewed for that referral uh, for collection. Seattle put its energy into getting the loans made and the businesses operating, but was admittedly remiss in loan collection follow-up and some of the rep record keeping required by HUD. While 20% administrative costs are allowed by HUD regulations, Seattle has typically used only 10%, and this commitment to maximizing the use of funds for programs and for loans may have adversely affected our record keeping and loan servicing efforts. Even though these problems occurred prior to Mayor Rice's administration, he does not deny that there have been problems. Rather, he has taken many steps to help resolve them, which we are in the middle of doing. With consultant help, uh, much of the follow-up documentation has been drafted, and we are working with HUD to review uh, that by HUD's program staff. Um, again, the numbers are in flux because we are in the middle of this process and therefore may not be exact. Mayor Rice has proposed 
the use of an independent contractor to perform all business loan servicing in the future, as well as ongoing jobs creation follow-up. The city is also in the process of reevaluating its overall economic development strategies. And as part of this effort, a new small business lending program involving a consortium of local banks and the city will work in partnership to provide these loans. Uh, this effort is expected to leverage about $6 million in private funds for loans to small businesses. This program will replace the current business loan program. As we work to implement our new business loan program, we will expect and look forward to technical assistance from HUD to ensure that we are following HUD regulations in the first instance. This, we hope, will help us prevent problems from occurring later. Mary Jean, who is with me today, will be the head of that economic development project. This pro program, the Black Grant program, is very critical to Seattle. Overall, we believe that the program is performed in an exemplary manner and will work with HUD to ensure that Seattle continues to use the Block Grant to meet both local and national program objectives. I'd be glad to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Hyde. Um, how much money has the City of Seattle received in community development Block Grant funding in the last uh, three years? Uh, we get a L over 10 million a year. Um, I don't have the total figure for the last three years. So it's about 30 million. L a little more years. than that. I realize you have been on the job just a short time, and we have, we have duly noted that. Um, roughly how many jobs have been created for low and moderate income people as a result of these uh, CDBG funds? Um, the current uh, records indicate that over 160 people have been employed because of these efforts. Now, I want to be very clear with you and state that very carefully because the definition of job creation and the number of people who have m um, been employed because of this process may not be an exact match. What the figures that I have at this point are what the files indicate, and that is that over 160 people have been employed by the pro pro uh, program for these current loans. Well, I, I was listening to your testimony very carefully, <coughs> and uh, you admitted, of course, that your record keeping is not perfect, but I think it's a lot more than record keeping. What we are dealing with is uh, city employees going out to the loan recipients and asking how many jobs have been created as a result of these loans. The loan recipient says three, three new low-income jobs have been created. The city people say thank you and walk out. And when the inspector general goes in and asks for record, payroll, so on, we find that zero jobs have been created. So I think there is a very serious dereliction of duty in terms of... Uh, verifying the statements of loan recipients. Would you agree with that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I certainly would agree that our documentation did not indicate what it was supposed to with, uh, according to HUD guidelines. I do not agree that we did not create jobs through this program. The creation of the documentation, which we are um, in gruesome detail going back and in the process of doing, uh, some of that latest information is from the borrower themselves. Some of it is verified by the employee themselves. Well, so it's not all borrower um, information. Let's look at recognizing the fact you've been on the job only a short time, but you did take over documents and so on. For the $30 million that you got in the last three years, what is your best estimate as of this morning of the number of low and moderate income jobs that were created directly as a result of $30 million you got? Um, I cannot answer that question. I came prepared to talk only about the 1% to 2% of the whole amount that we spend on this loan program. Um, I did not come prepared to talk about the whole block grant program. I'm sorry. I understood that this was just about the loan program. Now, in 1991, the Inspector General of HUD found that in 38 out of 39 business loans made by the City of Seattle, there was no evidence of jobs being created for low and moderate income people. Is that correct? That's correct, and we acknowledge that the documentation for that was not in the files. The Inspector General also found 
that 31 loans were past due and 20 had no collection activity whatsoever. Is that correct? Um, I, I don't remember the numbers, but yes, the audit did find that many of the loans had not paid. Well, you must have had some reaction to that. I mean, uh, is the audit way off? Is it all wet? No. Or is it pretty accurate? Uh, no, we agreed with the audit, um, um, Mr. Chairman. We are in the process of recreating the documentation that was not there. We also are in the process of um, um, up, uh, redoing and Im improving the loan servicing. And in fact, the uh, um, three steps that I told you we're in the process of taking to try to make sure that we get people um, hired who are um, uh, experts in the ability to do this and service those loans is in process. Uh, literally last week and this week City Council was reviewing those ordinances. Uh, they're expected to pass next week and uh, Mary Jean will take um, office on April 1st. In the meantime, we have been doing loan collection, loan servicing, and as I indicated at this point, 80% of the loans have paid within the last 90 days. Some of them are actually current. Um, so in some cases, there is a discrepancy between our records and the loan, uh, the borrower's records, so that in some cases, we may show a person one month behind or two months behind when the borrower indicates that their records show that they are current. So we are in the process of trying to reconcile those things. The Inspector General thought that the problem was so severe that uh, he recommended that the Seattle program be terminated. Is that correct? Not to my knowledge. Uh, we were advised by HUD in an advice letter to, to suspend making loans until the documentation was cleared up. Uh, because we were in the middle of a loan process, we got agreement from HUD to go ahead with those loan commitments, although no money has been expended on those new loans at this point. We are reviewing each one of those. So. I don't recall an audit finding or a recommendation that we be terminated. Um, there was a recommendation or an advice that we hold up making any further loans until we cleared up the documentation. May I ask both of you how long you feel it will take you to put Seattle's program in shape? Um, I think I'll let Mary Jean answer that because it's going to be her responsibility. Hopefully the um, specific findings in the audit that deal with documentation could get resolved to HUD's satisfaction in within 60 to 90 days. And then there are some of the audit findings that deal with the implementation of adequate loan making and loan collection systems. And the city's committed to putting those systems in place before commencing any new loan making activities. And we're hopeful of having systems developed and in place sometime in the summer. Ms. Ryan, may I ask you, you have studied the HUD report, the IG, the Inspector General's report carefully, I take it? Yes, I have. You probably have committed it to memory by now. Was it a fair report? Yes, I, I don't think anyone in the city of Seattle um, has any quarrel with the findings. They They seem to be accurate and everything, the spirit of Seattle has been to move aggressively to do whatever it takes to correct the documentation and to put good systems in place to move forward. Well, let me say uh, the subcommittee wishes you the very best of luck. Uh, you represent a very fine city, uh, which has an outstanding historic reputation for municipal government, and we want to be sure that that is maintained. Uh, I, uh, I uh, accept your statement of uh, not personal but collective responsibility for very serious mistakes in recent years concerning these programs. And I'm sure you're fully conscious of the fact that we are dealing with taxpayer funds which have to be handled with, uh, with the utmost care. I want to thank both of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Our next uh, witness is Mr. Chris Greer. Assistant Inspector General for Audit, Department of Housing and Urban Development, who is accompanied by Mr. Patrick J. Neary, Assistant Inspector General for Investigation, Mr. Robert H. Martin, Deputy Assistant Inspector General for Audit Operations, 
<coughs> wonder if I might ask you gentlemen to please stand, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to offer is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. We do. Please be seated. <coughs> Let me, before you begin, uh, Mr. Greer, um, express again my appreciation for the work of uh, the entire office, former Inspector General Paul Adams, and you personally. You have been enormously helpful to the work of this subcommittee, and I want you to know we very much appreciate your uh, uh, great background and perseverance, and uh, we are uh, very fortunate to be able to work with you. Your prepared statement will be entered in the record. You may proceed any way you choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for those kind remarks that uh, attribute to our entire organization and, and these fellows and their staffs and the work that they've done. We're pleased to be here this morning. Uh, we have prepared a, uh, a lengthy statement for the record, and with your permission, we'd ask that that be submitted for Without the record. Without objection, it'll be And I'll simply the summarize the, uh, the key points in that statement. Since October of 91, when you last held hearings on uh, the CDBG program, we have continued to encounter, encounter significant problems in the CDBG program. For example, we have issued 13 audit reports, which question $16 million in grantee expenditures. And during that same period of time, there have been 31 indictments and 21 convictions of persons or firms associated with uh, our investigative work into the CDBG program. In addition to that, we currently have about 140 cases that are currently pending, again, dealing with uh, CDBG matters. Our statement con contains some details on these investigations, and I would say that uh, those are highlighted by five individuals that recently pled guilty in Delaware County, uh, which uh, you just discussed with Ms. Artie. Likewise, our long statement points out serious abuses in Baltimore, Maryland, Houston, Texas, San Benito, Texas, and New Bedford, Massachusetts. We conducted these audits at the request of CPD program staff who had gone in and done their monitoring reviews, detected some problems, and asked us to conduct a, a more comprehensive audit. Our statement also comments on the completion of a multi-regional review of the economic development loan activities. These reviews pointed out that a substantial percentage of the activities were ineffective and costly in relation to the benefits derived. We believe that the problems in the economic development loan activities that are uh, included in our draft report are probably indicative of problems in the CDB tro program as a whole. In this regard, we believe there are three key issues that HUD needs to address to overcome the program's problems. The first area is in the regulations and the guidance provided to the grantees and the program uh, managers. The CDBG program, as you know, was created to provide entitlement communities with considerable latitude in making funding decisions to address local needs as long as these decisions meet one of the program's three broad national objectives. And this latitude is evident in the program regulations and the operating guidelines, as well in the way that the Department interprets and applies the regulations. This wide latitude provided recipients makes it difficult to determine what is and what is not a proper way to use CDBG funds. It is not uncommon for our auditors to encounter situations in which the reasonableness criteria must be used. As a result, Items that we question or declare ineligible using our best judgment frequently result in protracted, time-consuming negotiations with program staff and sometimes their legal counsel. Our longer statement cites three recent examples where this type of long negotiation occurred. We believe one way to overcome the vague regulations is for program managers to issue guidance to establish some more specific ground rules. We're happy to report this morning that since October, both the Office of CPD and our office have issued documents to better define the proper uses of CDB chun, CDBG funds for interim financing and for economic development loans. Assistant Secretary Condratis issued a memo to all the regional administrators and field office managers 
on March 6, 1992. We believe this document will go a long way to improve the uh, activities re regarding economic development loans. Likewise, we've also attached for the record a program awareness bulletin that our office issued, and that one deals with the interim financing, another activity that was discussed this morning. We believe more of this activity can and should be done to improve the, uh, the vagueness question. The second major area we believe is improving the monitoring of the HUD staff in providing adequate oversight of grantee performance. Monitoring, whether it's on-site or remote, is very staff intensive and it's information driven. Assistant Secretary Conjados and her staff have made concerted efforts to improve the quality of CDBG monitoring despite what we feel are, are significant shortfalls in both staff and data systems. At this point, however, we question whether these improvements can continue to occur because the CDBG program itself has, uh, I guess, reached its high highest uh, funding level in recent years in 1992. This coupled with several new programs coming in online for that same staff, uh, we believe it's unrealistic pre to presume that the uh, increased monitoring can continue and prevail. One potential way to overcome the staff shortages is to design a monitoring strategy that targets available resources at high-risk grantees and at high-risk activities. HUD is currently implementing such a strategy department-wide, and CPD has been doing this in, in, in a lot of respects for several years. However, this so-called accountability monitoring concept's effectiveness is dependent on obtaining and analyzing data in order to identify the high-risk area. It also requires establishing some types of performance measures so you can measure one against the other. Unfortunately, the data systems to accomplish these tasks are not currently available and will be need needed to be developed in the future. The third and last element we wanted to discuss is the ability to apply sanctions when grantees flagrantly abuse or mismanage their CDBG funds. Again, we believe that Assistant Secretary Condratis has done much more and has been more aggressive in taking actions in, in predecessor administrations. However, we also believe that several factors mitigate against a strong sanction enforcement program. Some factors flow from the program's design itself, while others are internal to HUD. We believe that the regulatory and perhaps statutory provisions for sanctions need to be streamlined and simplified. In addition, we believe program managers must establish and adhere to uniform and consistent policies and procedures in applying the sanctions. That summarizes my statement, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Greer. What percent of the more than $3 billion annually in CDBG funding is audited by the IG's office? That's a real <coughs> difficult question to answer sure. because the, uh, the three billion is not really three billion. We've talked about 108 guaranteed loans. We've talked about interim financing. So it's really more than three billion a year that, that the, uh, the program has available. Yes. Uh, and we only scratch the surface. We do on, a, on an annual basis average about 25 or 30 audits a year. When we do audits, we don't look at the whole grantees uh, yearly activities. We only look at maybe a, a small percentage of those activities. We do a very segmented audit. Uh, so unfortunately, we can't give you any strong uh, or firm figures, but I, I would guess it's in the neighborhood of about 5%. About 5%. So 95%, you simply don't have the opportunity to audit. Yes. Now based on, on your audits, do you believe there is a real problem concerning misuse or questionable use of these funds, or are we just making a mountain out of a molehill? Well, we think there's, there's serious problems in, 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 uh, in several situations, as, as evidenced by our audit reports, as evidenced by HUD's own monitoring reviews. Uh, so no, I don't think we're making mountains out of molehills. How would you characterize the problem? Widespread? Significant? Well, every time we serious. do an, yes, every time we do an audit, uh, 
and there's many reasons why we do audits and as I mentioned earlier a lot of them are at the request of program people we don't do audits where we don't find problems uh, but it is it's very difficult to say how widespread the problem is as you alluded to in your opening statement there's many many success stories but there are also in our view some uh, very flagrant problems now HUD issues literally hundreds of policy memos advising grantees on interpreting regulations yet many of the grantees continue to claim that they're confused about key aspects of uh, the program such as job creation how can this problem be solved I think probably the best way is what I alluded to in my statement that that we simply have to lay out the ground rules and then through the interpretation of those ground rules issue guidance issue decisions that clearly define what it is we expect uh, the grantees to be doing with the CDBG funds regardless of the activity that they're undertaking is the CDBG program being effectively monitored to assure that low-income people are being helped in a lot of respects it is being effectively monitored I'm not sure if the uh, the systems allow us currently to to provide you with a good data on exactly how many low and moderate income people are being helped we recently uh, did an audit in st. Louis Missouri and found uh, significant problems in the way that that grantee was counting uh, benefits uh, and when we went back into the St. Louis area office to try to figure out why they didn't uh, detect or know that there there was some indications that there's problems in the monitoring system at least in the St. Louis office we probably will expand and, and do some more of that review but oftentimes and I don't think the monitoring for low mod benefit is any different than any of the other monitoring it is as I said earlier I think there's there has been and will continue to be an absence of staff to do the type of uh, on-site monitoring that might be needed to to meet perhaps your expectations to what extent do you think inadequate staffing contributes to program abuses well there's there's definitely in our view inadequate staff in the, in the CPD uh, area at the present time and is that, HUD asking for more staff their current this budget, area their current budget is for I think about the same as as last year is it your judgment that that is a mistake since you just testified that inadequate staffing is one of the reasons why abuses continue I'm not sure I want to call it a mistake it, it's either you you uh, design better remote monitoring and find other ways to use uh, information so that you don't need to have the staff intensive uh, situations or you get more staff well have they designed better remote monitoring mechanisms we're in the process of doing that now you are in the process of doing that we when I say we I mean uh, working with the office of uh, okay Ms. Kondratis. okay well gentlemen I want to thank you very much for both coming here and for your work and the subcommittee looks forward to working with you for a long time to come thank you sir appreciate this we will take a five minute recess Subcommittee will resume. Our final witness is Ms. Anna Kondratis, Assistant Secretary for Community Planning and Development, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development. If you please raise your right hand, you solemnly swear.
that the testimony you're about to offer is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I so do. help you God. I do. Please be seated. <coughs> Ms. Kondratis, we are very pleased to have you. Your prepared uh, statement will be entered in the record in its entirety without objection, and you may proceed um, any way you choose. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm also very pleased to be here to participate in this since proper management and good management of the CDBG program is my top priority as CPD Assistant Secretary and certainly I am very eager to have this program work as well as possible. So I appreciate your efforts in that regard, the efforts of the Inspector General in assisting us to achieve that goal. Could I, I ask you to pull the mic a little closer? Yes. I would like to say that I, I, since my prepared statement is in the record, I would only like to make one comment on the prepared statement which might cause some misunderstanding. I mentioned in the prepared statement that the program becomes vulnerable to abuse because of the lack of front-end review of, of HUD's capacity to do front-end review, which was defined by the Congress in 1981. I believe in my last hearing you pointed out that this was an administration, a then administration proposal, and I just wanted to emphasize that um, even though this exposes the program to some degree of abuse in that HUD only sees things after the fact, it was hotly debated in the Congress, it was an administration proposal, and it was an experiment to see if we could make a more flexible program work well. I did mention in my testimony, although it may be lost on, in, the, in the initial characterization of this reform, that I believe that our confidence in local governments has not been misplaced. I believe that if we, I do not think that it is necessarily, um, I do not think that it would necessarily limit abuse if we went back to front end review because the costs of expanding the bureaucracy to do front end reviews may not justify the abuse that we may actually um, uncover since I think abuses found in the program today are a small percentage of the total of the total CDBG program and therefore one would have to weigh very well the cost and benefit of going back to front end review before doing so. I just wanted to uh, clarify that particular part of my testimony. I'm ready for questions. Very Thank good. You. Well, the testimony we heard today shows that, uh, at least in many instances, the program is not tightly controlled or closely monitored. What is your comment about what has unfolded uh, for instance, this morning? I think that it's uh, always unfortunate when any money is misused or abused, and we certainly are doing our best to try to limit that abuse as much as possible. I think it is also true that, that uh, our administration and management of programs could be improved. I doubt very much whether there is any agency in the government that could not improve administration of their programs. I think that we are moving in that direction. I do not think that our administration of the program is such that it exposes um, the program to abuse or that it uh, threatens the integrity of the overall CDBG program. All of the cases that were brought up at the last hearing and this one, for example, are cases that HUD is well aware of, that HUD is moving to correct. These are not surprises, and one of the reasons they're not surprises is because, as you may know, we have almost 900 grantees, but we spend 60 to 90 days each and every year reviewing their performance reports of each and every grantee. We do risk analysis to see who, would, who we should monitor on site. We monitor on site more than half of the grantees. There are as many as 50,000 separate uh, activities in any given year, 15,000 subrecipients. And I think CPD field staff in monitoring has found something like 3,000, on average, finds 3,000 violations per year of CDBG regulations or the law. And for the most part, we find something like 93% of them are very minor and easily correctable. I think the testimony from the City of Seattle indicated that very often it's not that there is an abuse of the program as a lack of documentation that would um, enable us to say with confidence that the money has been well used. We're working together with our grantees, not in an adversarial fashion, but in a cooperative fashion to make sure that we have that documentation. But a lack of documentation, many of these findings do not indicate there is an abuse 
case, it indicates a negligence, a, a violation of some regulation, and we move to correct it. I think only 11%, even in the current monitoring system, only some 11% of our findings are repeat findings, which means that most communities do not want to violate the laws and the regulations, and once they're told what the correct procedure is, they conform to that. We don't have problem. we have willful violations of only 2% in the entire program. And we move to correct those, and if necessary, we move to involve the Department of Justice and we bring indictments in cooperation with the Inspector General and the Department of Justice, but those are so rare that one wonders if one really, if one put on much stricter controls or expanded front-end reviews, whether the payoff would be there. Given the small amount in the program of abuse that we find, I'd also like to point out that you have focused almost exclusively on economic development loans. That is definitely one of our high-risk areas. We've identified it as such. We've been working for more than a year and a half to try to get some control and better guidance out to communities on economic development loans. Nonetheless, economic development is only less than 8% in 1981 of our whole CDBG entitlement program. So that if you have minor abuses in 8% of the program, you can't necessarily make generalizations about the remainder of the program. Well, uh, that's an interesting observation, but it must be viewed in the context of the IG testimony just a few minutes ago that they in fact look at perhaps 5% of the operation. So 95% of the operation goes unaudited. And um, if you put that together with the Delaware County case, where had it not been for an individual who blew the whistle by going to the press with the results that we have seen, major, mm -hmm. major scandal, a major scandal, large-scale abuse of funds, um, you are really forced into asking two questions. One, on the, on the upfront review issue. As I understand um, your statement, Ms. Kondratas, you are not sure that the additional cost of uh, front, upfront review uh, would really be cost effective. That the cost of doing that might be more than the abuses and mismanagement and possible embezzlement that we might catch under those circumstances. Is that basically your view? That is basically my and view. Is that why you are not recommending that we go back to front-end review? Yes, until we finish completely reviewing the entire situation of program management, as the Inspector General pointed out, we are trying to improve our systems, we're trying to evaluate our management procedures, we are issuing and both guidance and training to the field, we are undertaking a whole number of procedures which... So when will you finish this process, at which point I take it at the moment, you have an open mind on whether you go, want to go back to front-end review, or are you opposed to it? I don't see the justification for it right now, so I suppose that would say that I'm opposed to a legislative proposal to go back to it, because I don't see, given the level of abuse in the program, the justification for it, unless someone could demonstrate the cost, the benefit of it. Well, let me, let me stipulate, for the sake of this dialogue, Mm -hmm. that the cost of front-end review might exceed the savings. Mm -hmm. Do you attach any value to increasing the confidence of the American people in the fact that their tax dollars are properly spent? Doesn't that have a value in itself? I think the American people can be confident that the CDBG program as a whole does not waste money. Um, you mentioned that the Inspector General has said that he might audit up to 5%. I doubt that it's even that much as 5%. But I'd like to point out that the, that the Inspector General, as he himself noted, generally goes into problem areas, problem areas that we know are problem areas because of our monitoring. We monitor 100% of our grantees in reviewing their grantee performance reports. As I said, each one takes us 60 or 90 days to do. We identify where the problems are, so we're confident that for the most part the program works very well. Monetary sanctions, I talked about the sanctions that we do, or the, the findings that require monetary repayment of CDBG funds.
is ab about 1% on average every single year, and for the most part, those are repaid. Not everybody challenges the fact, as Seattle did not, if set, not the monetary finding, but our findings in general. Um, and the money is repaid to the CDBG program. I think for, for a federal program, in fact, for any program of this complexity, spending $3 billion annually, that's a remarkable record. I think the taxpayer gets very good value for their money. Well, you know, problems where funds have to be repaid because they were improperly expended mm -hmm. represents only one problem area. Another problem area that we discussed earlier, and I don't know whether you were in the room or not, relates to the allocation of scarce funds to programs that didn't need them. I mean, we had the case of, um, of the Saudi businessman who bought a building, announced that he would uh, renovate it, repair it, without even knowing that this program exists. And then Miami city officials go to him and tell him about the program. And the 1% loan is offered to a private developer who didn't even know of the existence of the program and would have proceeded using 100% private funds with his project. So I think it's very dangerous to assume, as your earlier answer indicated, that the only problem we have is a problem where funds are absolutely misused, used contrary to regulations, there is fraud, repayment is required, and so on. We are also very much concerned about the effectiveness of these funds. Are these funds being used in the highest priority uses? Or are they just being pumped out? Take the case of the Rolls-Royce dealership. I mean, uh, what, what is your view of uh, uh, the, the two Miami examples that we dealt with? Uh, uh, the case of the Saudi businessman who didn't need this money to complete the project, didn't even know these funds existed, and the Rolls-Royce dealership, which apparently as a result of uh, publicity in the media decided to drop its request and went ahead and used private funds to, to go ahead with uh, its business. Let me answer the, the uh, first part of your question first, the better targeting. Yes, I think this administration is on the record with legislative proposals indicating that we feel we would like to have the federal government move in the direction of encouraging communities to better target their programs. As you know, we submitted legislation to that effect in the early part of this administration, and it was roundly rejected. We wanted an anti-poverty strategy. We wanted a higher proportion of um, funds targeted to low and moderate income persons. There was a compromise made. That was one element that we did get. We wanted uh, a different accounting method to make sure that low and moderate income projects were, were more carefully looked at and reviewed as to benefit to low and moderate income persons. And, um, and that was turned down by the Congress. So we, the grantees themselves don't perceive the program that way, apparently. And so the Congress rejected this, uh, this attempt at targeting. Now, we are still jawboning grantees to target better, to think about priorities. We are meeting with um, low-income advocates and, and representatives of various low-income groups in order to, to figure out how we can use the citizen participation process to help better target in localities. I, we are providing $30 million of technical assistance funny, f money in CDBG um, technical assistance, most of it is to target better to low-income communities. We're going to teach, in including economic development. We would like to see more economic development be not downtown development, but economic development in low-income neighborhoods and communities. We're going to be releasing this kind of technical assistance money in this coming year because we are concerned about that. But let me now, on the second part of your questions about the for-profit businesses, first let me say that in spite of your constant repetition of the, the term Saudi businessman, I don't see the relevance of whether he's Saudi or rich or poor or Israeli or a New York lawyer. Well, let me explain <laughs> to you the relevance. Let me explain to you Please the relevance. Do. I'll be delighted to, to explain the relevance. The relevance is that on the basis of sworn testimony, 
uh, the gentleman representing that group indicated that they were ready to, to proceed using entirely their own resources without American taxpayer funds at 1% being made available to them. Now, it, is, it may come as a surprise to you, but it isn't, I think, to, to many of us, that Saudi businessmen uh, are viewed as being financially affluent when they invest millions and millions of dollars in real estate in the United States. They are not the people whom Congress had in mind when it appropriated scarce hot funds for community development block grant purposes. So the relevance of my observation is that these are not the people who are targeted by the Congress for the receipt of 1% money. I agree with you. They're, they're not, they Do you now see the relevance of my observation? Well, not entirely, because I think you, you miss... Well, to what extent don't you see the relevance? I think you missed the point. No, I the don't think I missed the point. Well, let me explain then, if you listen to what I mean. For-profit businesses are eligible recipients and intermediaries in the CDVG program. There it's not relevant who the for-profit business is. What is relevant is, is the law complied with, is the benefit there that was supposed to be there, slum and blight removal, have the, um, has the money been repaid, and so on and so forth. Assistance to for-profit businesses is not disallowed. It is allowed in the Community Development Block Grant Program, and I think it's if we allow assistance to for-profit businesses, yeah. then all we have to really regulate is whether it's legal, whether it's appropriate, and if we don't think it's appropriate, well, we certainly have the opportunity after the fact to, to say, well, you should have done something else or you could have done something else. But this program is not constructed for the federal government to second-guess local decisions. HUD did, I would remind you, insist that before this loan was made, a public hearing be held and the citizen participation requirements that HUD has put in place honored. So I think it is, um, it, it's, the other, the other thing that you need to remember is that if the federal government gets in the business of assi assisting for-profit businesses at all, you sure don't want to assist failing businesses because then you don't even have a good project. I mean, if you're assisting for profit businesses, it makes sense. And I think the, the Miami float loan program is, is actually um, doing the right thing by funding people who are likely to pay the money back. You need to understand the whole float loan concept as well. This is all money that's already committed to other projects that did undergo the citizen participation requirements. You want to use it, not have it sitting there, because most communities have about a year and a half of unspent funds in commitments because projects need to get prepared, um, land needs to be cleared, and so on and so forth. So they have this money sitting there doing nothing. It's an expansion of the use of the money to set up float loan programs, and of course you need an absolute guarantee that that money will be repaid on time to do what is scheduled. So I think in, in the instance that you, you let somebody use money on a short-term basis, you do want to make sure they have the capacity to pay it back. Well, listening to your explanation, I'm afraid I come to the conclusion that you missed the point. So let me try to explain to you why you missed the point. And I would be very happy to have you react. The question is whether the five million dollars in CDBG funds were necessary for the Saudi business group to undertake this project. Their sworn testimony is not only that it wasn't necessary, but they didn't even know this program existed. Do you still believe it was the proper use of funds? Because the issue clearly is not whether these are for profit or not for profit businesses. We all understand that it is under the right circumstances where it is a necessary attribute of a project going forward, for profit businesses may obtain CDBG loans. That is not at issue. The point I am making, and I would like you to answer, is whether you favor allocating scarce CDBG funds in instances where the private for-profit business, U.S. owned or non-U.S. owned, doesn't require these funds and doesn't even know that they exist prior to announcing that they're proceeding with a project. 
In no instance would I approve of that. But well, that I listened. No, but I listened to the testimony this morning to your questioning of the two witnesses, and I can I can understand how something like this could have occurred. I can't comment on this particular case because I'm not familiar with uh, the upfront financial analysis review of this business or, or anything else. But I can tell you, just, just from listening, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation. Somebody can announce that they're going to be doing a project without ha having financing firmly in place. Some, then they can start looking. I mean, they might have the financing and they might have every confidence because they are a successful business that they will get the financing. But being a for-profit business, the motivation is to get the best deal in your financing that you possibly can get. And they shop around. Now, it's very possible that somebody in the city of Miami, not necessarily the Community Development Office, informed them of the availability of these funds, particularly since this was already being negotiated with the former owner. And it's perfectly appropriate that they look for this source of funding. I do, you know, I don't know all of the ins and outs, and I didn't do an investigation either of an inspector general audit level or even on, on an FBI level as to the financial status of all these things. But it doesn't seem unreasonable to me that any for-profit business can announce a project without having all of the loose ends tied up. In fact, the loan wasn't even committed by the, the city of Miami until they went through the public participation process and the citizen um, participation process. So um, it's not surprising to me that a for-profit business would try to do what it does best, namely try to make the best deal possible in any circumstance. Well, I'm happy to have you on record that you feel that it was congressional intent to have don't put words in my mouth. I no, did not uh, say that. Don't interrupt me, please, Ms. Condratas. That's a very bad habit. Uh, excuse me. It's a very bad habit. So let me al allow me to finish my statement. I'm very happy to have you on record as stating that in your judgment, congressional intent in providing HUD funds was to create 1% loans for business groups, in this instance a Saudi business group, that on the basis of its, swor its own sworn testimony did not require such funds to proceed with the project. You are perfectly free to hold that opinion. No, and, I repeat, and I'm I glad did not that say you, that. You do. I repeat again, I didn't interrupt you, I listened to it. That is not what I said. And the other thing well, I'd like to Well, what did you say? All I said is that Congress allows communities to use their judgment in providing assistance to their communities through the intermediary of a for-profit business. My role is not to second-guess the city so long as the law is complied with. I comply with the law the way the Congress wrote it. Do you differentiate between more worthy projects or less worthy projects? Well, I personally do when I, I have my opinions about worthy and unworthy projects. But I think that, uh, and I think communities are required in the community development block grant citizen participation, public participation process to try to set priorities. But it is not the role of the federal government to second guess a community's priorities. We can only try to encourage them to do what we feel is a higher priority, which is targeting to lower income neighborhoods and communities and people. So you are incapable of making an evaluation between two projects, one which used federal funds that the people doing the project claimed they did not need and resulted in the renovation of what continues to be a totally empty office building in an area of an office building lot compared to a variety of other potential projects which would have current economic value. Your statement is that you do not wish to second guess what the community has done. So if the community has chosen to do something which is clearly not a high priority operation in terms of HUD's own criteria of providing employment and other things, you are you're saying that you remain neutral, you are unwilling or incapable of making a judgment as to whether this was a good use of HUD funds. I'm not saying that I'm unwilling, I'm saying it's irrelevant because the Congress does not give me the power to look at that 
before the fact and make a decision like that. I, I see the projects that are funded after they're funded, and, and we monitor to make sure that both the law was complied with, the process was complied with, that there's no regulation violated. But I, Miami doesn't come to me before they fund a project, and particularly in a short-term float loan process, and say, well, Ms. Kondratis, do you think this project is better or this one? What do you think the CDBG program is all about? Nobody does that. That's not what the Congress envisioned the federal role to be. So I can give my opinion after the fact. What is it? My opinion is that this program ought to be targeted exclusively to low and moderate income neighborhoods and fund only projects that really ha are of some value to the community and to low and moderate income people. We are trying to run this program to make it comply with that as far as possible. But I'm not going to be, be I'm not here as a, as a lawyer and a judge in some kind of trial on a particular project of which I d am not privy to the financial details of. I do not jump to the conclusion you jump to that it was necessarily something that was atrocious and egregious. Well, being in charge of a federal program and being unwilling to evaluate its efficacy <coughs> is, a, is a new phenomenon. It uh, seems that's a new element you've brought in too, its efficacy. Mm -hmm. You haven't been talking about that before. Well, that's all we are talking about. This building stands there empty. It would have stood there exactly the same way without a dime of HUD money. You are defending the use of HUD money for this project. Mr. Lantos, first mm -hmm. of all, we're in an economic recession. There are a lot of office buildings that are standing empty, which doesn't mean that somebody's business decisions after the fact can be second-guessed. It's easy to Monday morning quarterback on the efficacy of any project in the for-profit sector or the government sector. This building will be occupied as soon as the economy recovers. There are many people employed in, in, in rehabbing the building. In fact, as I understand it, low and moderate income people were employed in rehabbing the building. It is no longer a blight on the city of Miami. It has historic significance. I'm not going to say it's a bad project. I, am I going to say that I, that I personally might have preferred that the money be used somewhere else? I might have. But I'm not going to say that that is a bad project, and it certainly is not an illegal use of CDBG money. Did you suggest that it's an illegal use? We had questions about it. We are mo in monitoring the City of Miami's economic development program, as we, as we do in all our monitoring, we always raise questions when there is insufficient documentation, when there is an insufficient justification of how you know, a, a national objective is met. So yes, we question it all the time. Uh, that's what our monitors do. That's what they're in the business of doing, is questioning the, the efficacy, the relevancy, and the legality of every project. In the Delaware County case, had we not had a whistleblower, do you think it would have come to your attention? Do you have a I'm glad major problem? Yes, sir. I'm glad that you asked me that question because um, I think that there was a, a misstatement earlier that this came to HUD's attention only as a result of a newspaper article. Now, it's true that we do find out about some things like that, but as a matter of fact, I think both the HUD monitors and the Inspector General were in the Delaware County offices a week before that article appeared. What is your uh, reaction to the Inspector General's concern that with additional programs now, the size of the staff will continue to prove to be inadequate to do a decent job of monitoring and supervision? I share his concern. I've shared it. I've been concerned about this for the last three years, and I have therefore taken steps in order to make sure that we can utilize the staff that we do have in the best possible way. I am concerned. I think we're stretched to the limit on staff. So I have been making modifications. One is a c computerization, more data systems, better data systems, so we could review, um, review our programs um, with greater speed than we're currently doing, the 60 or 90 days that it currently takes. We're using paper back and forth between our grantees and ourselves. We could be using computer systems if we got them developed. I'm concerned also I've done things like um, make reorganizations of staff. I've transferred all UDAG closeout functions from the field to headquarters so that we saved 37 staff years in that one move alone. I've made other 
adjustments to transfer work from the field that is very time consuming. For example, I've directed in the management plans that any, any finding that isn't resolved in a year should be transferred to headquarters so that we could deal with it, so that the field staff could, could spend more time monitoring. I could list at least 10 to 12 other such management improvements that I've made or have begun to make because some of these things take time. I've met with our grantees over a period of a year to try to develop some paperwork reduction requirements and some proposals that will be both regulatory and legislative to reduce the burden on grantees as well as HUD staff in terms of the paperwork burden. So I think I've been, I've, I've been very concerned and I've been acting um, to try to reduce the pressures on our staff in their doing their work and have them do it but with the new programs to be monitored and supervised, you seem to feel no need for any additional staff. Let me put it this way. As a program manager, I would love to have additional staff. But I think but I... That's your responsibility. I have pointed that out. However, I think that you will understand when we... that this is not a personal decision. It is a process that has many different ramifications. HUD does ask for increased staff. However, the CDBG program is not the worst problem spot and problem area at HUD. When the Secretary... What is the worst problem area? Well, I'm not going to. You have the Inspector General's reports I'll, and the GAO reports. Mm. You think um, there are worse areas than this? <laughs> do you think this is a particularly I, bad area? I'm asking area? the question. Yes, I'm yes, I do. Worse areas. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like what? I, I, I'm not going to suggest that. I think you have the Inspector General reports and the GAO reports mm -hmm. on which I make my statement. Mm -hmm. In any case, I think when we ask for staffing, clearly you want to balance things. The taxpayer and the Congress and the administration don't have any particular desire to expand the federal bureaucracy. And if you listen to the federal, the, the presidential candidates, you'll see that that's the sentiment about that the federal bureaucracy doesn't need to be increased. So you try to make the most of what you have and things that where the integrity is threatened. Um, I think that that's the, the place where you try to put extra staffing or ask for increases. I do not think, I, I, I said I, I was concerned, and I said that I would love as a manager to have increased staff. However, I do want to point out that I think that the, m the actions that I am taking, if they're successfully carried out, don't threaten the integrity of either the CDBG program or any of our new programs. If I thought it did, I would be the first one to start shouting about it and ask for new staff. Let me just say to you that in the abstract, no one wishes to expand the federal bureaucracy. But if the appropriate regulatory entities would have been in place, the savings and loan scandal under the Bush-Reagan administration, which will cost the American taxpayer hundreds of billions of dollars, would not have taken place. And you have to juxtapose this mind-boggling deregulation mania, which has resulted in hundreds of billions of dollars of cost having to be borne by this generation of taxpayers and future generation of taxpayers against an infinitesimal amount of money that could have been and should have been used to prevent these scandals from unfolding. Had there been proper supervision during the Pierce hot hearings, that this subcommittee had, had there been an attempt to look at coinsurance early on rather than picking up these incredible scandals as this subcommittee did subsequently, vast amounts of taxpayers' dollars could have been saved. So don't in the abstract talk about expanding the federal bureaucracy. Only a moron would advocate expanding the federal bureaucracy, but there is a legitimate cost-benefit analysis which needs to be made between doing the job properly, which the deregulation mania prevented large numbers of entities from doing, and seeing to it that the taxpayers' interest in keeping the federal government lean are observed. In the abstract, expansion of the federal bureaucracy is a program that no one in his right mind would advocate. Intelligent people who are responsive to taxpayer needs and concerns want to see to it that there is an adequate number of air traffic controllers and people who see to it that the savings and loans don't go amok 
making loans in an irresponsible manner that is costing the American taxpayer hundreds of billions of dollars. The issue here is not whether anybody wants to see another 500 people in your program. The issue here is whether if we had additional people would we still be looking at the scandals we have looked at like the million dollars here in the city of Washington that was given to a funeral parlor for expansion the money is gone and there is a hole in the ground the Cabazon Indians running the gambling casinos with HUD money uh, the Delaware County brochures distributed to the school children Nowhere, nowhere was there a requirement that these be HUD funds. There, no HUD funds can be used for these projects. So the issue is, as is obvious, to strike a balance between the staff that is needed, used at its maximum efficiency, to do the job. Yes, my sir. Question is, my question is, whether under present circumstances, with the addition of the Home and Hope programs, the existing staff can do the job properly. That's my question. My question is not whether I wish to expand federal bureaucracy. The answer to that question is no. My answer to your question is yes. I think we have the staff capacity and competence to manage these programs well. Now, you, uh, you admonish me not to talk in the abstract, but I've been talking only about my own program. I can't comment on all the savings and loan scandal and all of these other things that, that you have brought into the, the equation. I think I am managing my own programs well. They are, their integrity is not threatened. You mentioned, you said that if we had more staff, could we have caught this, that, and the other thing? Well, we, I want to remind you, we did catch all those things with our current level of staffs. And in fact, most of them were funded in 86, 87, 88, and that wasn't, we didn't have Home, Hope, and all the other programs then. So I, I don't understand your point. I told you that I think that I am managing the programs well. I think the integrity of the CDBG program is not threatened by our current level of staffing. Our Chief of Staff has some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Congratis, in your testimony, you proposed spending $30 million for technical assistance on economic development. However, you intend to contract out this technical assistance. With the shortage of HUD staff, why not use this $30 million in resources to hire additional HUD staff to increase the amount of technical assistance that HUD itself can provide grantees? I think the law doesn't allow us to do that. We can't transfer technical assistance money from the CDBG program and put it to our s and &E account to fund HUD salaries. Would you, like, would you like to see the law change to allow that? Do you think that would? No, I think the technical assistance is necessary for the grantees, and I, I think sometimes it's, it's more efficient and effective to contract it out to have it done. There are lots of organizations, particularly since we're trying to target to low low-income neighborhoods in this technical assistance. There are competitions that we run because all of this is competitively awarded. There are many organizations such as Enterprise Foundation and, the, um, and LISC that are perfectly capable of providing technical assistance and probably would do a better job than HUD staff had I to train them, hire them and train them in the time that that would take. I, I don't think the TA money um, can be better spent, and certainly we don't have the flexibility to use it for staff under current circumstances. Let me focus on Delaware County. Two years ago, the HUD Inspector General issues an audit report, finds more than $5 million was misspent, says repay $1.6 million. To date, two years later, only $400,000 has been repaid. What has happened to the other $1.2 million two years later? In, in Delaware County? Delaware County, Pennsylvania. I think there's more, more at stake than just that amount of money. I, I don't understand what, where the fears is something like $5 million. Or he either. said that $5 million was misspent, but he said that $1.6 million had to be repaid, mm -hmm. that being the distinction between the two. To date, only $400,000 has been repaid, and there's $1.2 million in limbo that has not been repaid two years later. 
I think there is more money than that involved, but whatever the amount of money is, um, we have sent Delaware County a demand letter asking that they repay the whole questioned amount. I think we've given them enough of a chance to explain themselves. I know in the testimony this morning, the, the representative from Delaware County said that they would still try to negotiate with HUD, but I think we have had enough negotiation, we've had enough opportunities for their presenting evidence, and I've sent a demand letter asking that Delaware County repay all of that to their letter of credit to the Community Development Block Grant Program. If they do not do that, then we will have to go to the next step of asking for an administrative hearing. When did you send out that demand letter? Last week. Last week? Yes. After we had notified your staff that w that was the one of the that projects. Are you implying that was the reason? I'm suggesting a cause and effect relationship between the two. Why did it take two years to send out a demand well, letter? Well, first of all, it takes many, many years to negotiate with communities that insist that they're in the right and you're in the wrong. The, the whole sanctions process. But is the sanction process negotiating with the cities yes, for very two often. years? No, no, no. The sanctions process is not negotiating with the cities. But whenever we find a problem, we first try to negotiate with the cities before sanctioning them. Right. No one's arguing with that. Negotiating. That sometimes it's the length of the negotiations. The, the length of the negotiations is it's to, to, review as, uh, to review papers and papers and $5 million worth of spending. You can't do that in one week. It takes months for letters to go back and forth. But you have a detailed HUD Inspector General audit report, which is uh, 100. But when the grantee disputes the findings, it still is incumbent on us to, to prove it, to negotiate with them. I think that we have made, done our best. The other thing is don't forget that we don't play with the same actors all the time. The, the crowd that was responsible for all the abuses have been indicted, have gone to jail. I mean, HUD isn't a police force. We can only point out the problems. Then, then they've, they've, uh, they've um, well, I may actually, they may not have gone to jail, but they have certainly been, this, this whole issue has been under FBI and DOJ jurisdiction for some time now and not, not under HUDs directly. We do, we're working with the community. It's a new group of officials for the most part. They did transfer, we had problems with the redevelopment authority. They did transfer the program from that redevelopment authority to another agency. We wanted to give them a chance because if we do sanction it, who suffers? The people that are supposed to be making, getting use of the money. So we will try to avoid that if possible. We believe in the good faith of communities when they tell us they have um, a way of managing the program when they transfer the program from an agency that has a record of failure to an agency which does not have a record of failure and may be willing to do that. But then at a certain point, um, they have to either put up or, or come to the sanctions process. I think the whole sanctions process, it be, because of various court decisions, puts HUD in a very difficult position. It, it's um, looking for my notes on one of the... Um, okay, but we're not talking about the sanction process. We're talking about the negotiation process. Why do you wait two years to send a demand letter? Oh, we don't wait and two years. And that's just the beginning of the process. Of my understanding, then you have to go to a hearing before an administrative law judge. We have Let me just ask one question. On average, how long do you negotiate with a community which has been found by the HUD IG to have misspent money and where the HUD IG recommends that those funds, in this case several million dollars, be repaid? Is two years about average? I don't have an average. I can get you that for the record. I don't have an average. You, you have it, no idea? It really depends. Figure. I mean, I, I don't think, I think that the, uh, our, does, uh, Willingness to negotiate depends on the on the grievousness of the of the offenses and what exactly it is that is being questioned, whether it's simply documentation or whether it's the integrity of the entire operation. So I think I, I don't I certainly don't have at the top of my head the average length of time it takes to negotiate. But um, I think on, in most cases it doesn't take much negotiation at all. Things are repaid rather rapidly. So I, I, how far we're willing to go before we decide that we're going to sanction? Well, we've, you know, we do sanction. We have proposed sanctions, and we are in, litig in litigation on, in one instance, and we have send demand letters. But again, it's not so easy. We can't go in and arrest people who refuse to cooperate with no us. No one's suggesting, Ms. Kondratis, that you go in and arrest people. What we are suggesting is that you might not wait two years to send a demand letter, we which did is not. first the beginning. You did not wait two years to send a demand letter? We have sent demand letters before. We have been constantly negotiating back and forth. That includes letters asking repayment. Okay, but asking letter asking for repayment and a demand letter are two different, uh, two different things. They're very 
similar. Very They're very similar. similar. When I asked the I, question, when did you send the demand letter, your response was last week. Let me put it this way. Our last demand letter was sent last week. And there's the same types of letters. The first one says, please repay. The second one says, pretty please. And the third one says, if you don't repay, we're going to uh, have an administrative, proceeding, an administrative proceeding before an administrative law judge? <laughs> no, that's not what they say. Um, Jim, I'd like to introduce Jim Broman, who is, um, who is a division director in the Office of Block Grant Programs. He has long and detailed knowledge of all of these operations as well as the Glad Block Grant Program. You, whatever comment you have. Yes, I would like to point out that uh, the process that we have followed in the uh, uh, county of uh, Delaware is, is not atypical. It certainly is taking longer than many of them, and I think it has to do with the complexity of the issues. We do advise the grantee to pay the money back in almost all instances very early on as a, matter, as a way of settling the affair. We do, however, leave the door open for them to come forward with some additional information if they feel that, uh, that, they don't, that, uh, that this is not a noncompliance. No one's questioning leaving the door open. What we yeah. are questioning is leaving the door open for two years. Well, I that's think there's right. a we point understand where that. you want to close the door. We understand that. And, uh, uh, in retrospect, this has probably gone on longer than it should have. Uh, we have, as Ms. Kondratis mentioned a moment ago, uh, taken steps this past year to try to get these old cases referred to headquarters more early on so that we can uh, bring things to closure more quickly. We're also looking at the process to try to bring some structure to it so that we won't allow our uh, so much time to go on in this negotiation process before matters come to closure. I think you said the magic words, it has gone on for longer than it should have. That's my personal opinion. I, I think it's, it's all, I would second that, and that's one of the reasons we've been undertaking some of these changes that I had mentioned before, like transfer, not allowing mm -hmm. a finding to be out in the field for longer than a year, which was never the case. So they will come to headquarters where we can resolve them more quickly. I definitely agree with the Inspector General and, and all of the other things that have been said that we can improve our program management. We will be doing that. Um, and and. We are working on regulations also, which hopefully you will be helpful to us on, on trying to improve the whole sanctions process. Is there anything else you would like to say, Ms. Kondratis? No, I thank you very much. Well, let me make an observation. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that uh, you are doing uh, the very best job you can uh, in terms of your perception of your responsibilities. It would be helpful if you would have the same attitude towards congressional committees. When your boss, Secretary Kemp, comes before this uh, subcommittee, he comes with a refreshingly warm, cooperative, friendly, constructive atmosphere which is fully reciprocated. As a matter of fact, every single appearance of Secretary Kemp before this subcommittee, even under the most difficult and painful circumstances such as the hot scandal, uh, could not have been more mutually friendly, polite, professional, cordial and constructive. Now, it would be very helpful if uh, you were to try to establish the same pattern of relationship with this subcommittee that your boss has succeeded in doing uh, with uh, no difficulty and tremendous results. You do your job and we do our job. You have, during the course of this hearing, repeatedly praised your own performance, which is your privilege. And I am more than happy to give you credit for all the good things you are doing. You need to understand that when an investigative subcommittee of the Congress highlights program flaws, whether those are flaws of fraud, waste, abuse, mismanagement, embezzlement, improper priorities. That is our job. The job of this subcommittee is not to highlight the achievements of HUD. 
The job of this subcommittee is to be a watchdog for the American taxpayer so that he can feel secure that funds appropriated to HUD are properly expended. It is very important for each of us to understand our role. Your role is to manage your program as effectively as you can. There is no doubt in my mind that that is your intention. My job is to highlight the failures, the shortcomings, the deficiencies, the difficulties, the illegalities of programs. That is my job. Don't take that personally. But it is important for a cabinet sub-officer to recognize what respective roles we play. Your responsibility is to put HUD's best foot forward, which you are doing with great effectiveness. I would not be doing my job if I would say thank you for explaining to me what an impeccable job HUD does. Hearing is adjourned. That is not my responsibility. My responsibility as chairman of an investigative committee is to ask the questions that every American taxpayer would want to ask, but in a representative form of government, that task is delegated to the Congress, specifically to its investigative committees, which hold hearings. So let me say to you, because I hope I'll have the pleasure of working with you for a long time, it is important that we approach our respective jobs with the right, with the right mindset. You are here to protect HUD and all its actions. My job is to recognize, as I did in my opening statement, that the bulk of the community development block grant programs are valuable, well administered, and the American taxpayer should feel comfortable that his tax dollars are properly spent. It is also my job, as it was in the, ori in the original HUD hearings, to point out that HUD, in a previous administration, allowed an individual to keep selling HUD properties but never transferring the funds to HUD. That was discovered. Lots of other things were discovered. The American taxpayer will be satisfied once these hearings become very short. Because if you come in and make your initial pitch, and I won't have any questions to ask, we won't have any examples such as the ones we have had here, with the funeral parlor in Washington, with the Cabazon Indians, with the Delaware County, with, uh, with uh, uh, the business group that didn't need tax money to get its job done, I will be very happy. There are plenty of other responsibilities a member of Congress has. Holding hearings is a very time-consuming responsibility, which takes me away from my other jobs. These hearings are lengthy because there are many problems. And if you and I approach our respective responsibilities with goodwill and respect for each other's respective roles, perhaps the hearings can be shorter. Would you care to comment or are you satisfied? I'd just like to respond that I'm terribly sorry that you misperceived my attitude. I don't think I was either trying to praise myself, nor do I think that I want anything but the best working relationship with this committee. I agree that maybe sometimes I might seem brusque and abrupt, but I should hope that you would understand since that is your style of operating as well. I, I think that... Um, Thank you. <laughs> it isn't a lack of desire. Flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> it isn't a lack of desire to cooperate with the committee or a desire to, to de-emphasize your role or to, to indicate that you're doing anything but the proper thing in your position. Thank well, you. Since I would like not to be either brusque or abrupt, let me ask you one more time. Is there anything else you would like to share with the subcommittee? Nothing at this moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are happy to have all of you. Hearing is adjourned.
Wendy, how are you? Oh, not bad. I've been on jury duty. In fact, I gave somebody uh, three hundred. Did you get on the jury? Take care. Nice to see you. Thanks again. David. I'm Randy. Randy. I appreciate you. For more information on these proceedings, you can write to the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing at B349A in the Rayburn House Office Building here in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20515. And be with us tonight for a hearing of the House Rules Committee. Members of the panel met this week to discuss legislation that would create a British-style question period for the U.S. House of Representatives. If passed, the bill would require members of the President's Cabinet to appear before the House and field questions from the membership. You can see the discussion of that bill tonight beginning at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time, here on C-SPAN 2. Coming next, it's a look at congressional leaks. Cable television can be an effective teaching tool. That's especially true for the programming on C-SPAN, so we created C-SPAN in the classroom to help educators teach with C-SPAN.